Welcome, everyone. We have, today we have a special episode of the Reach Truth podcast. I've got Chris joining me, who's been on before. And uh, a while ago, I had the idea to do, originally, I was going to do an interview with myself where I was going to film myself asking myself questions and answering them. Uh, but I realized that the way I wanted to do it was just going to be prohibitively too much work. So I asked Chris to interview me since he expressed some interest in doing that. So yeah, this is an interview with me, and hopefully that will give some context for the podcast and for anyone that's interested in kind of my projects and uh, maybe give some more color and interest to the different kinds of conversations that we have. So thanks for doing this with me, Chris. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it in your hands. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. I'm, uh, I am having to control myself from asking you that question you ask everyone oh. that makes them squirm at the very beginning of your episodes. <laughs> you can feel free. I mean, I deserve it, right? Um, I don't even, well, um, well, I feel like in the case of you, people can, it's, it's pretty, if people are listening to this, they probably already kind of have that answer. Mm -hmm. Um, so rather than focus on, um, like you telling the story of your life on the spot, um, I am much more interested in, uh, where in the world are you right now? What are you doing and how's that going? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm currently in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I just got here yesterday. And um, yeah, I'm sort of on this pilgrimage of sorts. I've done walking pilgrimages in the past, and this is sort of a, a variant in my mind on the traditional pilgrimage where, you know, I'm, I'm pretty online. As you know, I'm, I do this podcast and have different projects that are online. And that feels like an important part of my livelihood right now. So uh, this is kind of a different pilgrimage where I'm trying to stay with different folks for, uh, you know, ideally something like a month or six weeks or something and, um, you know, be rooted in one place, get to know my host better, my, my friend and uh, develop that connection. And then also be able to do my projects from their place and then uh, go somewhere else. And yeah, I kind of started doing that because when I first left Maple earlier this year, um, my original plan was to get a job and, you know, an apartment somewhere and a car. And uh, I'd actually done that before to some extent when I left Maple previously, because I was, I did two training periods there. Uh, but that just didn't really feel like the right thing for me when I went down that road. I uh, was doing some work. And although I liked the work that I was doing, I just found that my own projects were much more resonant and uh, seemed to be helping people more. And they were more enlivening for me. And um, yeah, so I started asking around different folks that would be willing to let me stay with them for, you know, a month or six weeks or something like that, and have been compiling a list of different folks that are willing to host me. And, um, you know, it's still early. Um, I was in Portugal earlier this year, and then I was in Austin and then Oklahoma. But uh, yeah, so this is my next stop is Colorado. And, uh, but so far, I've really enjoyed it. It feels like a, a good way to live to kind of connect more deeply with different friends and, and connections and, uh, you know, work on the projects that I'm doing that I, that I feel are of service. Do you have a sense of, um, how long you want to, you want to live this way? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm really trying to do it. Um, you know, when I, when I did walking pilgrimages, the, the practice was, uh, if you get to an intersection, you, you don't have a plan of where you're going. Like a, a traditional, so there's a form of pilgrimage where like, oh, you're going to this specific holy site or something like that. But this was a different style where it's like, you don't have a plan of where you're going. Each moment is an opportunity to decide. So you get to an intersection and you're like, well, I could go left here. I could go mm -hmm. right. Which mm -hmm. way do I go? And uh, <laughs> and you decide left. So mm -hmm. I'm really trying to bring that spirit to this pilgrimage where like um, I, ha I have sort of, vague plans for, you know, maybe the next six months of things that are sort of options that are available to me that I might do in a certain order, but uh, I'm trying to decide my next stop in the stop that I'm at in, in kind of the spirit of that. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, it might be that I do this for a very long time. I could see myself doing it for a very long time. I could see myself stopping it. I could see myself returning to it. Um, there's a lot of different variables and uh, just trying to take it one day at a time, really. And uh, so far, so good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so in consideration of, of um, 
Well, in consideration of a lot, a bunch of things. I mean, um, like you're wearing um, some sort of, you know, you're, you're signaling something with the way you do your dress and um, the content you produce is on topics often related to Buddhism. Um, and I'm just curious, what does your day-to-day -day look like? As, as much as that can kind of be boiled down, because you're, sometimes it seems like you're really online. You're like super online and you're also produce things. Um, so, so what, what are you working on? Like, how does that, how does, how does a day look in your life right now? Hmm. What's the, I, I'm, the, the question sort of surprised me because it's like, what is, what day in my life? And you started talking about my, my, you know, my sash and uh, like Buddhism and stuff like that. How, how do those two parts fit of the question fit yeah. together? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think the way that I'm fitting them together is that most people, I can relate pretty easily to a life where it's like, all right, I work nine to five, you know, I have a job or, all right, I don't work a nine to five. I have a pretty flexible schedule. Um, I don't get the sense you're working like a nine to five. I don't get the sense you have a traditional structure like that. I have the sense that you might be doing a lot of things um, that I wouldn't expect um, yeah, that I, that I just wouldn't expect. And also you're more productive seemingly than a lot of people who do work nine to fives. Mm. So I'm kind of like <laughs> wondering like, how does this all fit together? Because you have practices you're working on that are obviously not, um, they're not going to generate you income, you know, and you're not even necessarily doing them outwardly. You're a student in some sense. And so like there's a student side, there's a productive side. And it's like, what, how, how do those things feed each other? uh and, and what does that look like okay okay i got you yeah. uh yeah hmm i yeah i think to maybe i'll i'll take it from the big picture and then sort of zoom into the day-to-day -day of um big picture something i've really wrestled with over the last year certainly when i was in monastic training but also now that i'm out of it is um well, you, you know, since we trained there, like Maple isn't a traditional monastic environment. They're doing something pretty different than, than other trainings. It's certainly inspired by different traditions, but it's not the same as them either. And so a, a real question that I had there was like, am I even a monk? Am I a monastic? What does it mean really to be a monastic? And certainly by certain traditional definitions at the time, I wasn't a monastic. And then, you know, all the more so now that I'm out and about. Um, but, you know, I ended up sort of conceiving of it as, as a sort of spectrum where, you know, there's definite traditional monasticism and then there's people that are definitely a lay person. And then I think there's a lot of room in between for interesting explorations. And I've always felt that, you know, a simple life dedicated to being of service, dedicated to practice, you know, based on generosity is, is a good life. And so I, I think I'm bringing those qualities into my life now, even though I'm doing my own thing. I am, you know, definitely more on the layperson spectrum now. Uh, there's lots of things that I do that I wouldn't do in a traditional monastery, but uh, I am trying to live that kind of a life, a simple life, one that's based in practice, one that's based on service to others, and one that, you know, is also supported by generosity. That's my primary income right now is my Patreon. And uh, yeah, uh, so it's not a traditional path, but it is inspired by, you know, the training that I did and also traditions before that, um, you know, it, it's very non-traditional. I'm, I'm sort of carving out my own path that, that feels like right livelihood for me, which is not something I've seen anyone else do. I mean, certainly Peace Pilgrim has been a big inspiration and in the pilgrimages that I've done. Um, she sort of carved out her own path as well. You know, there wasn't and, and still isn't, thankfully, there isn't like a peace pilgrimism or something like that, you know, uh, thank goodness, right? Unfortunately, Jesus and the Buddha messed up there and they, they have isms, but there's no peace pilgrimism. So I think she succeeded, at least in that axis. Uh, hopefully there won't be a Tashanism either, uh, but um, God forbid. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm carving out my own thing that feels good for me. And it's not, it's not, it's certainly inspired by Buddhism. It's inspired by Peace Pilgrim. It's inspired by Taoism and other, and other things as well. But it, it's not any of those things, at least as has been handed down to me. And, you know, it's going to change as well. Everything changes. And I'm sure it'll take different incarnations as my life goes on. Um, you know, it, I'm not attached to this specific way of doing things or something. Um, mm -hmm. 
And that comes down to the day-to-day -day level as well. It's like, you know, I posted this question a while ago that I ask myself often, uh, which is, I forget exactly how I framed it, but it's, it's like, how can I give my life to service today? Or how can I be of benefit today? And each day is different, you know? Um, it's sort of the opposite of a training schedule at a monastery, you know, that, that we did. It's like every day is the same, even there things are different, you know, uh, but there's, there's a structure of a thing that you do every day. And uh, while there's certain habits that I do every day, I do standing meditation and Tai Chi every day and some other things. Um, every day is really different. And I'm just leaning into that of, you know, for one, what is my mood? Uh, what is my energy level? Uh, what kinds of things are interesting to me? What do I have scheduled? And I try to uh, make use of the situation that I find myself in both, both externally, you know, I'm in Colorado right now, what's, what's good to do now that I'm in Colorado, but also internally of what's my energy level or interest or uh, motivation or what projects are exciting to me and sort of mash that all up and, and make a plan. What's, what can I do today to be of service? And, you know, it's interesting that you say I'm productive because, you know, that's certainly true. I put a lot out there and I, I think um, that comes from basically doing this every day. I, I, I don't, I don't think of like work days and non-work days. It's just there are the things that I do today. Uh, and I think that has a part of it, but, but it also means like, you know, recently I've been noticing over the last months, like mm, on some days, my body just doesn't feel very good. I think I have some health issues or something like that. And some days I just don't feel very good. Like I'll have a headache or my body will ache or be tired. And um, on those days, I give myself permission to just, you know, take care of my body and do what feels good for my body. And um, that that's that's the same thing. That's right. It's it's what what's here today, internally, externally, what is a good use of today? And uh, that's a different answer on different days. Sometimes it means taking care of my body and resting. And sometimes it means calling a friend or sometimes it means working on a blog post or doing a podcast or, you know, whatever. I just try to do the thing that given what I know about myself and my environment and my schedule and you know, what options are available to me? What's the highest benefit I can do that day? Lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good answer. Bad question I asked, but good answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so off of that, I'm curious. Um, so you had you had Vince Horn from uh, Buddhist Geeks um, on your podcast and talked about his transparent generosity model, which I think is just, just so interesting. Um, really like that. Um, me and you have had conversations about Donna. We've had extensive conversations about money um, in relation to, to Buddhism. Um, and one thing we haven't talked about that I'm very curious about is um, since starting your Patreon, you know, like how is that feeling? You know, like how, how is this working out? Um, and, and maybe, um, yeah, how do you feel about just, just the models that are out there for people who maybe want to do a similar thing to what you're doing? Like, how feasible is this to, to, to apply to other people? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been really blessed and grateful for the support that I've received on Patreon. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting almost $500 a month right now, which uh, is, is such a huge help. And between that, and I do have some savings, like that's, that's enough that I can live on right now. Um, it's not, uh, I think 500 a month isn't like my total expenses. So I would like to get to the point where I'm getting say like a thousand or 2000 a month so that I can, especially, um, this is sort of one of the weird configurations of like, you know, if I was just, uh, meditating in a cabin or something like that, that would be certainly enough to get rice and beans or something, but I'm trying to live a life of service. And today that means like, you know, there's a bunch of software project products that I pay for, or like hosting fees or, or certainly travel since I'm traveling from place to place and yeah, food and uh, all, you know, there's just expenses that come up of living the weird life that seems to be to me, <laughs> if that's a benefit. Um, that's not, it's not like a traditional monastery where, you know, it's, it's pretty, you know, rice, beans, maintenance on the building, that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, that's a way of saying the expenses are higher than I, than I'd like, but, um, and I don't, I don't think 500 would be enough to sustain this in, indefinitely, but I, I think, um, I've been very grateful to see how quickly it's gotten that high. I think that, uh, my sense is that's, that's sort of a sign of, 
uh, a lot of goodwill that's been built up from the different projects that I've done over the years and the different connections that I've had and uh, that people do want to support what I'm doing and see that I'll use that in a good way. And um, I've been very grateful for that. That that in itself means a lot to me, uh, just the validation of, of, hey, we like what you're doing and believe in you and the projects that you are doing of benef- are of benefit. Um, that, that, that means as much to me, if not more than the financial support itself. Um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, how to put it, Bo- both of those variables make me uh, like hesitant to like make an overarching recommendation for other people because one, I, th- I think I did have the advantage of, you know, having been online for years and having done projects for years and uh, before I started my Patreon and so sort of having a lot of goodwill already and uh, co- existing connections. And so, you know, I wouldn't expect that someone just starting out on their projects today would have that kind of support immediately. And also even, even in my situation where I do have that kind of goodwill, it's, it's practically speaking, it's not uh, enough to solely support me right now. I expect my, my, my sort of expectation is if I keep doing the projects that I believe are of benefit in the world that, you know, in due time, people will support me and sufficiently to cover my needs. So, you know, sometimes various anxieties come up, uh, worry and, and whatnot, but I think on my good days, uh, when I'm clear, I'm, I'm not very worried about it. And uh, there, there's some sort of, so there's some posts that I made a while ago on Twitter about money that are um, like many of the posts that I write on Twitter, sort of aspirational, where it's like, this is, this is my highest wisdom. And I may or may not live up to this on a, on a given day, but this is what I'm shooting for. And certainly money is an area with that. And, it, and, and I forget exactly how I put it, but it was, um, and I'll make sure to look that up and put it in the, the tweets for this. Um, podcast, but it's something like, you know, money is just fuel and it's, it's just a source of energy. And so you don't need to store it, just give every gift that you feel motivated to give and receive every gift that comes your way. And you, you know, basically don't, don't come from a place about, of anxiety about money, just use money to give, use money to live a life that's a benefit and it, and it will come in the ways that you need it when you need it. And so, uh, I try to live by that and, it's, it's, it's not easy to live that way. I, I do find a lot of anxieties or worries coming up on different days. And, you know, again, that, that comes to like, I feel different on different days. And some days I feel like, oh yeah, I'm great and feel alive and excited. And some days I just don't feel so good or have different worries come up and, um, you know, but I'm trying to live more and more by that. And, and the, the, the support that's come my way has been very validating of that, I think. Uh, it's like, yes, we do want to support you. We do believe in what you're doing. And that's been very helpful and, and, and fueling the work that I'm doing. Mm. Um, so I'm aware that I, I put the word Donna out there in just a general sense of like, oh, we've talked about this in the past, but yeah. um, I, I'm, I wasn't saying it to imply that what you're doing right now is related to Donna, but I'm curious if you see connections, if you see... Um, uh if it if it is related in some way and if it in what ways it's not related like how it's how it's different because um you know i'm no i'm no scholar um but um it seems like a concept uh a, a way that it's difficult to um update it and make it make it fit well with the modern world and this culture this, this modern, uh, American culture that we're in. Yes. Yeah. And just for someone that may not know, Donna is a, is a Buddhist term for generosity. And and traditionally it was meant to be, uh, the practice of supporting monks in monastic settings. And, uh, you know, in that respect, as I say, I'm not a traditional monk, I'm doing something different. There are certainly things that I do and ways that I live that are not, uh, in line with various monastic practices. Um, but I do think there's, there's continuity there. And ultimately, I think the most important thing about Donna is that it's uh, an act of generosity. It's, an, it's, a, it's a gift. And um, I think Donna is a way to practice and express in a Buddhist context, right view. One of the elements of right view in Buddhism, and this is mundane right view, but is that um, 
broadly that what you do matters, that your actions have consequences. And in particular, there's a there's in the passages about right view and in the Buddhist sutras, um, I forget exactly how it's phrased, but something like uh, gifts matter, that if you give a gift, it has consequences. And, and there, the opposite of that would be, you know, if I give a gift to someone, it does not matter. There are no consequences to that action. There is no benefit to anyone if I give a gift. And in the Buddhist practice of right view, it's like, no, that's, that's wrong. Uh, gifts have consequences. Gifts do matter. You should give gifts. And um, I think from that perspective, generosity is a way to practice right view. Both, both giving gifts, people giving gifts and people receiving gifts. And, um, you know, so while I'm not saying I'm a traditional monk and you should support me for that reason, I'm saying, uh, well, you know, what I'm doing is, is monk-like, uh, sort of inspired by that. It's not the same, similar, different in some respects, but um, the act of generosity is the same. And if someone feels move to support me in what I'm doing, if they think that what I'm doing is good, that's the same kind of generosity. That's the same act. That's the same practice is, hey, I, this is something that I can do to give that will be of benefit in the world. Let me help this. And in that way, I think it's exactly the same and is certainly continuous with that. And that's, that's far more important than um, the technicalities of it. And, and from that perspective, you know, different people are going to want to give to different things. And I think people should trust what they feel moved to give to, uh, you know, for, for you, maybe it's a, you know, a certain kind of nonprofit or activism movement or something. And for someone else, it's going to be, you know, maybe they're going to want to support a totally different Patreon or whatever. But I think that connection of what you feel moved to give to is really important and a good way to practice generosity. Mm. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess one last question on this topic I have is, um, and correct my understanding if I'm wrong, but the way that a lot of, um, you know, the way that a lot of modern retreat centers do Donna is sort of like, well, there's this flat fee you have to pay because this is for the upkeep of this center and for paying teachers, hopefully paying teachers, right? Um, but there's like the, the money that goes into the food you're getting and stuff. And when you, when you have the opportunity to give Donna, you're only giving that for Dharma teachings. And so in terms of how you're sort of, how you're receiving money through Patreon, I don't think you, you are explicitly saying like, this is Donna. So I'm just curious, like how you maybe um, relate to that. Like, do you think people are giving you money for for dharma teachings or do you think people are generally giving you money just because they want to support you in doing whatever it is you want to do whether that is maybe explicitly linked to dharma such as like you know you do your saturday night metta writing a book on metta your blog posts often are explicitly buddhist or do you think that um even the the non-explicit um or or maybe unrelated stuff is also being supported all in one big pool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a few things there. One is, um, I, I don't know that I frame it this way explicitly, but I do think that I'm asking for Donna and generosity, uh, and that that's how I view it. I I, I view that money as the a gift of generosity, mm -hmm. and that it's a practice of generosity for me to receive it and to ask for that. Um, I don't necessarily frame it that way because people may or may not be practicing generosity in the way that I'm conceiving of it when they give. I think they're still, they're, they're still practicing generosity, right? They're making a gift, but mm -hmm. you know, they might conceive of it or speak about it differently. And from that perspective, um, I'd be interested in uh, speaking to the people that give to me and, and just sort of getting a sense of why they give and uh, mm -hmm. what they give for and what excites them and what doesn't. And I expect there's a, a variety there. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm curious about that. I have a sense with different people of what it is, but, um, you know, I'm sure there's some variance there. Uh, yeah. And for me, I don't know, it, it's definitely not like the retreat model that you're talking about of like, there are the expenses and those are a flat fee that you need. And then there's generosity. Um, you know, I, there are things that I receive income for. I sell like the digital productivity coach, for example, with James Stuber, he and I, work on that, that gets sales. And there's an old course that I did on writing that gets sales occasionally. Um, you know, I think I might put out more 
products and services at some point in the future. And that might serve kind of a function of what you're talking about of like paying for necessities. But um, yeah, for me, I, hmm. yeah. And I also, I also don't hold myself as a teacher per se. I think, you know, I do teach the technique of loving kindness, but I'm not um, holding like a teacher role for anyone. And I, I am not teaching out of place. Um, there, there's some things that look like that. Sometimes there's like a small retreat I might do with some folks next year, for example. Um, maybe that kind of thing will be in the future, but I don't hold myself as a teacher per se. And um, I also don't see a difference between like, you know, there, there's sort of different activities that just all seem good to me. There's my own practice and there's my different service projects and they just all seem like a, they're of benefit in different ways and they look very different. I mean, if you look at the sort of portfolio of things that I do, they're, they're wildly different, uh, but um, they all seem to be of benefit to me and mm -hmm. that seem like a good use of my time and a gift to the world in a various way. And um, even things that are not obvious that would be good to the world seem, still ultimately seem to me to be good. And so I try to trust that and uh, the money that people give fuels that it's a makes that possible so you know I don't know um I don't know a simple example would be I started drawing this year right uh I've done a lot of drawings and there's no um you know obvious like nobody asked me to draw there's no I'm not working to become a great artist it's just like this is something that's interesting to me and enjoyable and beneficial and it's actually been quite interesting as a practice like I get into interesting flow states and stuff that I I don't get from other practices and uh, you know, I think people are also moved by my art and enjoy it and I like it and, you know, but there's no, there's no like um, big purpose or goal or long-term plan with drawing. It's just like, this seems fun and enjoyable and beneficial. Yeah. So here goes. Um, and I, I, I trust that in my own life. And I think uh, if people feel moved to give to me, then it supports certainly that, you know, the explicit teaching efforts that I do with Saturday Night Meta and my book and various loving kindness projects, it supports this podcast, the blog, but, you know, also just me living my life in the way that I am. And um, I, I feel very good about that. Actually, I feel it feels very good to trust my own intuition about how to live my life. And I feel grateful for the support that people give me in making that possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, this is so interesting to me. And also, I hope that um, I hope more people who are interested in, in, in whatever ways it looks like in their life, um, doing what they think is, is of benefit for other people. I hope that becomes this becomes like a more um, attainable way of life, you know, um, you know, you're certainly not doing it for the money, but I imagine that it is quite um, rewarding, you know. Definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, there's something there of like, I, you know, I, I've mentioned this before, probably on the podcast, but I, I was terrified to take the Bodhisattva vows before I took them. It took me a long time to sort of get the courage to even decide to do it. And uh, there's a few things that shifted there, but one of them is like, you don't have to do it alone. Um, you don't have to be of benefit to all beings for all time alone. There are many people that want to be of benefit. And, and alongside that, there's many ways to be of benefit. And I think, um, broadly speaking, if you look at the various problems that we're facing on the planet today, there, there are lots of huge problems and no one really knows how to solve them or people have pieces of the puzzle, but not all of them. And I think the best thing that we can do is to, one, not hurt anyone, to live ethically as best we can. But within that, space of living ethically, not hurting people, uh, not hurting ourselves, then to do the things that we feel called to. And the things that I feel called to will be radically different than what other people feel called to. But my hope would be that if, if people live that way, where they're uh, doing what they feel called to, what what's a good use of their skills, what the world is asking of them specifically, that that will be, you know, the kind of thing that that moves us out of the, the major problems that we're fixing and uh, that, that we're facing. And uh, into, into a better and more beautiful world. And, and certainly at the local scale, I see that in my own life, that there's sort of a fit between who I am, what my skills are, what my interests are, what dreams and visions I have, and what the world is asking me, what the world provides to me, what is possible in my own life. And 
that connection feels really, really good locally in my own life. And I think that, that that's very much possible for other people. It will just look really different. It'll look different for different people. Hmm. So one thing I notice from talking with you and, and from, from, from knowing you is that even just the way you answered all the questions I asked, you're not calling back to things um, very often. You're generally, it seems like you're talking in a way that is approachable for a very wide audience. Um, not assuming that people are going to have the same obscure reference point that maybe you have. But at the same time, sometimes I will ask you a question that is related to some obscure reference point or some um, historical figure or, you know, random book and and more often than i would expect you're like oh yeah I, i've read that a couple times or or you know what i'm talking about and um so i'm curious i know it seems like uh i think you've written about this in some places but your your formal education not everyone who has access to a formal education like that um seems to really kind of like um mm, orient towards it in the same way like i, I from my perspective, I see a lot of people um, kind of build a whole identity around it and they're constantly signaling this knowledge. Um, and then a lot of people have the opportunity and kind of don't seem to, don't seem to go with it, don't seem to take it, um, uh, try, to, try to get the value out of it. So I'm just curious what that experience was like, how, how that has informed what you're doing now. Um, and uh, yeah, just broadly, I suppose, like what exactly are those foundations? Because I don't have that. I have a little bit of that, but I don't have that like, mm, I, I've, I've pieced things together. So it's like, what exactly did you focus on in college uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> or, or even after college, if it's sort of connected? Yeah. Well, you're pretty, pretty learned yourself in your own way. I, you know, you've, you've read a lot of stuff yourself and certainly things I haven't, um, you know, um, I don't, I don't think it's about any particular book I read or didn't read. Uh, there's certainly ones that I resonated with more or, you know, would recommend more, more to other people. But um, I think the, the style of education that I received was, was really what was significant. Uh, and, and I think, you know, maybe you pointed to this as well, but the way that I did that myself certainly was a little bit different than the way my peers did. I think looking back on it, not, not to uh, brag about it or something, but I, I look at back and I'm like, oh yeah, it makes sense. I did that a little bit differently, but yeah. So just practically, I went to St. John's college. Uh, they have two campuses, one in Annapolis and one in Santa Fe. I went to the campus in Annapolis. I was there for four years. Um, it's a small liberal arts school. And the thing that's unique about it is everyone does the same curriculum, you know, not 99% technically, there's like two classes that you can take that are uh, electives, but it's, it's almost entirely uh, the same program of study for everyone that goes there. And it's focused around the great books movement uh, that happened, uh, you know, associated with U Chicago, maybe in the, I forget exactly, but maybe the 1930s or 1920s or something like that. Um, I've forgotten the history there, but started in U Chicago and sort of broadened out. And the idea there is that if you uh, read the Western classics and discuss them in conversation with people, that that's, that's a, a formal education that's, you know, a liberal arts education that's sort of worth having both both in that you're um, learning the particulars of how Western civilization came about, but I think more importantly that you, by thinking with these people, reading how they thought, sort of going about it chronologically and digesting them, uh, you're internalizing, you know, higher levels of thought than you might do otherwise and sort of sort of wrestling with it, right, that you're interacting with it and uh, so that involved everything from philosophy, literature, history, history of math and science, um, you know, language, music. Uh, there's a they're pretty formal curriculum that you people can look up if they're interested, but it was mostly based around books, around reading those books and then discussing them in class. And then there was also, um, you know, there wasn't really tests or quizzes or anything like that. There were grades, but they were just nominal for the sake of if you went to graduate school, you you didn't even get them unless you asked to look them up. Um, and, uh, you know, it was mainly the conversations and then papers that you wrote that were sort of the basis of how you did there. And I think that more than anything has been what I've taken away isn't, um, I mean, there's, as I said, there were certain authors that I really resonated with, 
like you know Plato, uh, Don Quixote, the uh, Cervantes, uh, Wolf, you know other people. But um, at the end of the day, it was having lots and lots of conversations, asking lots and lots of questions, reading a lot of things, digesting things, writing about them. That that uh, and doing that repeatedly for four years. That was. Mm. Uh, the basis of my education. I see that most actually now uh, in in this podcast where uh, I think the style of questions that I ask, even though I, it's not based on a text that I've read with the person, it's, it's really based on the person that's in front of me and what they're saying and who they're, what their life is and how they're showing up in the world. But that style of asking questions and, and lots of practice asking questions and having conversations comes from my time at St. John's and, you know, certainly the blog as well, the different writing projects that I do um, that comes from my training there, but, uh, you know, yeah, I think the way that I held that was, um, although I was interested in the specific books and authors that were on the program there, and I enjoyed most of them, um, it wasn't for me about like, or or really anyone there wasn't, it wasn't about becoming a master of a particular text that you read there, but it was more about, learning and and ultimately for me, it was about living my life. I wanted to know how to live my life and uh, tried to look to books to find answers for how to live my life. And that's what I've responded to over the years and uh, tried to live my life based on the wisdom that I found there elsewhere. Certainly the Eastern texts that I ended up reading uh, played a significant role in my life. uh, Even those, those weren't on the program at St. John's and uh, I'm trying to live a, ba- a life based on the ver- the wisdom that I've found in different places, from books, from people that I've met, from experiences that I've had in my own life. And that that's why it's not about a particular idea or book or ideology. Um, certainly, as I've said, Buddhism and Taoism are, are major touchstones for me, but I just want to live my life in this setting as best I can. And that's there's no there's no one book that's written that can tell you how to live your life. Um, Your life is different than anyone else's life. And um, although there are books that can help you and tell you things that will resonate with you, uh, there's no, there's no manual or guide that's written just for you in this life that has all the answers. And you have to, you have to piece things together about how to live your life from books, but also from your own experiences and from the people that you meet that really resonate with you. I increasingly see everyone that I'm interacting with as a kind of teacher. Uh, Everyone, I learn something from everyone that I'm with, and I hope to be able to give something to everyone that I'm with, that they they're benefited in some way from interacting with me. And that's, that's um, so much larger than any one book or philosophy or ism and ideology can offer it it's much richer more complex more nuanced more custom to a specific person uh highly unique so uh that's what i've been doing with my life is trying to live the best life that i can based on the various sources of wisdom that i found externally but also internally and trying my best with that yeah Mm. yeah i didn't know that um i didn't know the school you went to focused so explicitly on the west which is really interesting to me um, because so much of your uh, presentation, um, your, your public facing presentation is, um, or could be interpreted as Eastern. And yes. so you have this foundation in the West, uh, which isn't, you call upon it sometimes, like explicitly it seems, but um, yeah, I'm just, I'm curious if you think that uh, like, was that of benefit to you to have to have that foundation? How, how did that how did that play into these explorations of Eastern systems and um, even maybe how you approach them? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly the people from the West that I read had enormous influence on me. Uh, and Plato in particular comes to mind. I, play, I was just fascinated by Plato and really internalized a lot of things from there. And I I think that that's still reverberating through my life. And especially in these conversations, I mean, Plato's dialogues were dialectical. They were based on dialogue, based on conversation. And that was, and and also um, being situated in a place, in a time with specific people, uh, that was tremendously 
impactful on me. Having asking questions, having conversations with specific people in a specific context, uh, that has been the basis of more wisdom in my life than than um, you know maybe like a treatise that tried to remove context, tried to remove particularity. Uh, the particularity has been a source of wisdom for me, and that's been highly influential. Um, you know, others come to mind as well, as I said, Cervantes and Wolf, especially. Um, but uh, yeah, I sort of turned East at a certain point, And that happened because um, in the sophomore year at St. John's, although, you know, it has a religious name, St. John's, it's not a religious school, but you do read the various texts of, uh, you know, Judaism and Christianity and uh, both the, the scriptural and theological and things like that. And because that's a part of the Western tradition, right? And I had been a, a, a pretty hardcore atheist in high school. And it, in retrospect, I, it was like I knew that the those texts were going to be triggering for me and that I wasn't mm. going to be able to read them charitably. Mm. So uh, I hit on uh, an exposure therapy plan of sorts, which was to read the Eastern religious texts because I didn't think those would be triggering for me. And uh, so there, the summer after my freshman year, before I had to read the stuff for sophomore year, I read... Uh, you know, the Dhammapada and the Tao Te Ching and uh, the Bhagavad Gita and also some other, you know, just popular meditation books. And I also read The Razor's Edge, which was quite significant for me, mm, some Reset Mom's yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. I love that one. I've read that maybe eight times or something. Um, and um, that, you know, reading those texts that summer and then, of course, reading the Jewish and Christian texts at St. John's in the fall, um, it hit me. It was like, oh, there, there's this thing, mysticism, and they're all pointing to the same thing. And, um, you know, they have different language and they're in different times and places and they use different metaphors and they have different teachings and practices, but they're all trying to point to things. And, and that there was almost a tone that was recurring for me of like the, the metaphor that I've used before is like, you know, I, I like movies and, and say you liked movies as well. And you knew which kind of movies I liked. And, and then you recommended a movie to me. You'd be like, hey, you haven't seen this, but you're going to like this one. You should go see it. And if I trusted your taste, then I would just go see that movie. You know, I wouldn't have any mm -hmm. doubts about it. I'd just be like, okay, Chris knows me. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. watch the movie. And then odds are I'd like it, right? Uh, it felt like that kind of tone of a friend making a recommendation of, hey, there's this thing that I've seen that you haven't seen yet, but you should really go see. Go, Just trust me, go do it. And it, I'm not, you know... It, it was almost laughable to me at that time, things that I thought before, I thought maybe religion is trying to manipulate you or take advantage of you, or it's a lie. And there, you know, there's historical reasons for that kind of way of seeing things that religions have taken advantage of people. There have been power <laughs> dynamics and stuff, but, but these, these authors, they're not, I mean, they, they're dead and they don't stand to benefit from you, you, you know, trying seated meditation or something like there's there, there's just no angle where they're benefiting from that you know centuries later when they're dead uh so um yeah that it was like okay i will try meditation that was that, that's what i hit on trying because at the time um you know i didn't have very much money and i, I also i did not want to be ascribing to a new ideology or believing something new i just wanted to try it out so you know i would sit in my dorm room and and meditate and uh, follow my breath at that time. And I, you know, I started a meditation practice that I kept up through, through school and uh, maintained a daily practice through my college years and sat a retreat. And at that point I was like, okay, I, I, I want to do this. And that, that's sort of when I started thinking about uh, monastic training and uh, sort of a next step there. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And um, I told you, um, We'd spoken about it before, and then finally now I'm reading uh, The Glass Bead Game by Herman Hesse, and I'm so surprised. I, when I asked you about this book, I didn't know what it was about, really, and it's so interesting how, how much there is in that book that's related to both this East-West yes. um, turn, uh, people specifically people in the West turning to the East. I mean, Hesse seems like a forerunner, really a great model if you want to look back and see uh, an early person trying to engage with this stuff when there was so little available compared to now. Um, and then as you were just talking about the, the move to monasticism, uh, the interest in monasticism, the glass bead game, um, you know, that those dynamics, like people leaving 
people leaving Castalia and having a very hard time adjusting to the 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 outside world because they have this um uh there's this elitism there's a sense of what we were doing there was the highest and in the in the regular world it just doesn't that word that view doesn't fit anymore and in fact it seems to cause a lot of um a lot of of suffering for people in this book um so i'm very curious you did a lot of writing on monasticism um, it's on can I blog. just talk about the glass bead game for a second? I, oh, feel free. Yeah. yeah. Riff, riff, riff. Okay. Cause, uh, well, one, I just want to flag, uh, Hesse was also a huge influence for me. I, I read, I mean, I don't know, perhaps something probably like 70 or 80% of his books are in my early teens and, uh, or, you know, in college and stuff. And the glass bead game is easily my favorite of his books, you know, mm. Steppenwolf as well is quite meaningful and increasingly meaningful to me, but, um, the glass bead game is probably my favorite. And, um, you know, a, yeah, a few things there. One, one is I, people may or may not know, but various characters in that book are sort of based off of different historical figures, like including Nietzsche, for example. Um, and, and some that aren't as well known, like there's sort of an obscure, uh, German historian, I believe that's, that's sort of fit into the book, but that's a really interesting thing. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I think another element besides this sort of West East turn that's sort of relevant to you and I is, and then the contemporary world that we find ourselves in is, is Twitter, actually. I mean, you know, various people have mentioned this, but I think Twitter is like the, the like maximum viable glass bead game at this time. Uh, lots of people have tried to make a glass bead game and those are really, there's a really interesting history there. You know, a friend of mine, Ron Hill Evans has made a, you know, like a wiki based on the glass bead game that tracks some of those. But I think the way that people use Twitter, especially in our neck of the Twitter woods, as it were, um, very much reminds me of the glass bead game. And the way that I use it reminds me of the glass bead game. And uh, uh, that's that's been a really interesting connection to make. And there's a, quite a few glass bead game fans in, in our part of Twitter. So, uh, and with good reason, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's an incredible book. Yeah. Um, did you, have you read, um, I assume so, but Journey to the East, you've read that as well? A long time ago and, and just mm. once, but yeah, I have read that one. Yeah, it's surprising how consistent the, the, the themes he seems to be grappling with are. And the Glass Bead Game, I believe, was his final work. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, just fascinating stuff. It feels, um, feels so familiar, feels so familiar. Um, yeah, one, despite, one thing that's... Oh, What's no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. One thing that uh, has really shifted for me over the years with his work is, uh, you know, his most popular book probably is Siddhartha. And I actually yeah. didn't like that book very much for a long time. Um, I, I enjoyed it, but, you know, compared to Steppenwolf or The Glass Bead Game or Narcissus and Goldman or Demian or um, Nulp, I really like Nulp. Um, but uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but um, I can't help you. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, the Siddhartha, I think, is is certainly not as good as the Glass Bead Game or or Steppenwolf. I think those are his two best that I've read at least. But um, you know, of course, because of the Buddhist themes, it, it did did resonate for me. And the thing that I really didn't like about it for a long time was, uh, and this is a spoiler if people haven't read it, so feel free to skip ahead, you know, whatever minutes. But um, this is the hottest spoiler alert ever for all <laughs> you people out there about to read the Glass Bead Game. Oh, no, no, you... Siddhartha, Siddhartha. Oh, uh, oh Siddhartha. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, um, the passage that really didn't resonate with me for, for a long time was where Siddhartha, the main character, um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, he finds the Buddha, he was looking for the Buddha for a long time, and then ultimately decides not to train with the Buddha and to go his own way. And at the time I was like, this is the Buddha. Like, why wouldn't you just train with the Buddha? I mean, I would, I, the Buddha and Peace Pilgrim, I would love to have a face-to-face -face conversation with either of them. And I, you know, I would, I would train under them, do whatever they told me to, no questions. Um, but I was like, so it didn't make any sense to me. I was like, this is the Buddha. Like, why are you training with the Buddha? You know? Uh, but then, especially in the last year, and as I've left Maple, I've come to see that really the value of uh, going your own way, making your own mistakes, learning from your own mistakes, uh, and trying to, you know, as Peace Pilgrim says, live your highest light. That's how she talks about it. You live your highest light and then more light comes to you, more wisdom comes to you. And, you know, if you just, 
I think for a long time, I sort of uh, disowned my own wisdom and sort of outsourced it to other people that I thought were wiser than me. And, and there is a value to that. There is a value to having a teacher to following teachings. It's not that I wouldn't recommend that, but at the end of the day, um, your own wisdom is the basis of your own spiritual life and other people can, you know, refine that can help you can support you in various ways. And a good teacher student relationship can certainly be a part of that, but, but it, you know, your own wisdom is, is what's being cultivated there, even in the teacher student relationship. And, uh, when, yeah, I mean, I made my own turn kind of like Siddhartha of, you know, I mean, basically turning away from the, the man that had been my teacher for years and uh, I'm not training with him actively and so are you and still love him and care about him. And I'm tremendously grateful for the teachings that he gave me. And yet, you know, it feels so good to be living my own wisdom in my own way and, and certainly making my own mistakes. And, you know, I'm not perfect and things that I have to learn on my own that, um, you know, probably other teachers have already learned or something, but like, but the process of learning it on my own through my own life is, is intrinsically valuable in a way that someone else can't give you that, even if, if they can help you in various ways, what you learn in your own life is extremely valuable. So, so that, that passage really shifted for me in the last year and um, understanding why Siddhartha might've done that. And, um, you know, that the book sort of changed for me and wanted to flag that because that, that was a huge change in my own life that, that changed that book there for me. Mm. Yeah, that's um, that question around around um, teachers and, and outsourcing, as you said, I think that is such an important thing to look at for people to look at. Um, yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, one more question on Hesse and mm -hmm. some of the things you brought up. So the introduction to the Picador edition, I think I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not sure. Uh, it's not even in a different language as far as I know. <laughs> this isn't just me not knowing how to talk. Um, <laughs> but the introduction does talk about, as you said, um, that, that some of these characters are pretty directly calling on historical figures. Um, and another thing that it talks about is uh, and a lot of his books are short, like Steppenwolf is very short, Journey to the East is very short, so Darts is very short, The Glass Bead Game, not so much. Um, but because they're so short, you can read a bunch of his works pretty quickly, uh, which I find useful. And they talk about how pretty much all of his previous works were straightforward and serious. And um, um, The Glass Bead Game differs because it's meant to be read in a playful way. It's the tone is supposed to be more playful. And um, as I'm reading it, I'm reflecting on that. And I'm just wondering how you orient to that. I sort of, mm, there's something, uh, it's, a, it's a serious book. It covers serious topics, but at the same time, there's something in it that is, um, I mean, it's the final work of someone who I would say is a master of, of their craft. And so, yeah, is there is there something you might see in the quality of his other work compared to the glass bead game that like why is it your favorite? Because um, mm. because when I think of it, I see it having the same themes as a lot of these other books. I haven't read as much of them as you have, but I see the themes are are very similar. Mm, but there's there's something about it that is that is different, or it's funny to say more mature because it's like I'm I'm not whatever age he was when he wrote it, but just feels different. And, and, and what is it maybe that's resonating with other people who I don't even know about in, in, in this part of Twitter? Like, do you have any guesses as to what this is or maybe um, any recommendations for how to read it? Hmm. Hmm. Well, um, I mean, it's been a while since I read it, but um, read it two or three times, I think. Uh, probably three times, and it's been a while since my last reread. It might, you know, this might be gearing me up for another reread. We'll see. But um, you know, one thing that I really, uh, most people at St. John's wrestle with is uh, the limits of a translated text. And you know, when I've read Hesse, it's been in, translated into English, and I I suspect that playfulness that that introduction is talking about would come through more in the German than in the translated English. Um, mm. it's funny because my own experience of it, I wouldn't necessarily 
have described it that way myself. I think some of his other texts, I mean, um, he, he had a huge, huge range of the kinds of books that he wrote and, you know, he has like poetry and um, um, I think uh, different stories were quite playful in different ways or uh, stylistically expressive in different ways. And the Glass Bead Game almost, um, to me, when I read it in my own reading of it was, um, th those aren't the adjectives I would use to describe it necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it felt like, I mean, he, a lot of the books that he wrote were Bildungsromans, you know, development novels of a, a protagonist growing up into maturity and facing various challenges along the way and so much. And it, it's like a, it's a straight Bildungsroman that's like played very well. So it's done masterfully. There's certainly mm -hmm. playful or expressive or creative aspects of it, but, you know, is it his, his most playful or most creative? I, I wouldn't have described it that way. Um, it does really resonate though for me. And for a lot of reasons, I mean, um, Castalia and the Glass Bee Game are just such captivating visions that are so intriguing and, you know, represent things about our world and our history that are interesting, but also my own life. I mean, St. John's was a kind of Castalia. Training at the Mask Academy was a kind of Castalia in different ways. And um, being out in the world, you know, that certainly resonates with some of the themes of the book that you're talking about and wrestling with that. What is a good life to live? How much of it is intellectual? How much of it is spiritual? How much of it is just enjoyment or living a life like hard to say um so I, I think just the themes and the world were very relatable and keep coming back for me and um have renewed significance for me different aspects and layers of it you know what we were talking about earlier with twitter being a kind of glass bead game i think that's very interesting to me continues to be very interesting to me um so you know i, I can't point to one particular thing is it's just it's a masterful book it's so so mm so captivating, at least to me. And, um, you know, it's been one I've returned to over the years. Great. Yeah. 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 Good points. And, 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 and that, that thing I was pointing to, like, um, I can't even, uh, I could, if I saw it on the page, that word, the development, what is it? Uh, Buildings um, Roman. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's the kind of thing that you just have, like, you know, you just got. Oh, well, that's my to. favorite genre since I've read Hesse so many times. I mean, it, it was wow. the kind of book that he wrote and uh, it means growth novel in, in German. So Bildungs is like mm. growth and then Roman is novel. So it's, it's like growth novel. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's long been a favorite genre and uh, mm. something I've really resonated with. And, and for the same reasons that we talked about of like looking to books for how do you live life? I mean, that's what a building mm. German is about is what life is, how you mm. grow through it, what challenges you face. And, and you can kind of learn things even in fictional worlds from how people struggle with things and mm. what challenges they face and what wisdom they learn. And that, that influences you, you know? Mm. Do you think that, uh, do you think Ender's Game falls into that category? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of, I haven't read I've read most of Ender's, the Ender's Game series and the Ender's Shadow series, but um, not much outside of that. But from what I understand, a lot of Orson Scott Card's books are buildings Romans. And interestingly, mm. apparently, uh, some of them are like straightforwardly Mormon buildings Romans, uh, mm. where they're like set in a Mormon world and things like that. Mm. Um, but yeah, he that that's the genre that he wrote. And uh, yeah, I've always resonated with Ender's Game series for that reason as well. Yeah, that's another book that seems um, extremely influential to a lot of people who are connected to you on Twitter. Yes. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, so um, you touched on it a little bit uh, uh, earlier, talking about how you don't view yourself as a teacher. You talked a little, little bit about how you oriented towards a previous teacher. Um, and I'm curious to hear um, how it's been how it's going, <laughs> being for, sort of put into um, uh, a teacher, more teacherly role, um, how you relate to that and, and why you relate to it in the way you do. Um, like why are you choosing to, to, to orient in the way that you're choosing to orient, however that may be? Yes. Well, this is something that's changed over the years and I suspect will change again over the years, um, uh, I'm, I'm, you're sort of asking me at a particular time in my life and I, I'm very aware that this will probably change for me in the future in various ways that some ways I could anticipate, some ways I can't. Um, you know, it's funny when Maple first started, they were, they were uh, it wasn't called Maple yet, it was called the Center for Mindful Learning and, and they were 
the thing, one of the things they were focused on was creating mindfulness teachers for schools. And there, there was a mindfulness teacher training program. And I wanted to train there. I visited for like a week and I wanted to train there, but I was like, oh yeah, I don't really want to become a teacher though. I just want to do the mindfulness practice and do, do the meditation. And, um, you know, over the years that I trained there, especially as I felt more and more called to the path of responsibility and to being of service in the world, um, you know, that shifted where it was like, okay, I'll, I'll teach if that's what's being asked of me. And certainly when I was there, that was asked of me. I did teach both in California and in uh, Vermont in various guises and forms over the years, uh, you know, just teaching on the Sundays. There's recordings of these on YouTube of the Sunday sits that they do of me teaching those. And, um, and you know, also teaching people one-on-one, -on -one, giving talks. All, I did all that kind of stuff in different guises over the years at uh, while I trained there. Uh, and in a way, the world asked that of me for a time. And uh, that's been a part of my path. Um, I hold that very differently now, currently at this time in my life. As I say, I suspect this will change, but I don't have one principal teacher right now. There are people that I'm learning from in different respects, certainly Tai Chi. That's a big way that I'm sort of studying something under someone in a teacher-student capacity. Um, that's been a big part of this year since I've left is learning the Tai Chi form that I've been learning. Uh, with Stanwood, who's who's been on the podcast, um, but uh, I don't currently want a teacher in the way that I previously had uh, a teacher, which would you know was was really good for me at the time. I, I I'm grateful every day of my life for for the teachings that I received from Soryu and the training I did with him. But that's not what I'm looking for right now, and I also don't want to be that for someone else right now. I have another thread about this on Twitter where it's like you know I don't I don't want students, I don't want teachers. I want peers. And I think um, I'm happy to help people if they ask for my help. I'm happy to ask for help and receive help in specific ways. It's not that I don't want to learn anything myself. It's not that I'm not willing to share something that's helped me with other people. In fact, I'd love to learn from people. I love to share what I've learned with other people, but I like to hold that in a, in a sort of non-hierarchical peer way where um, you know, some people are better at certain things than, than I am. I mean, Stanwood's better at Tai Chi than I am there. You know, they're, um, you're better at various things than I am. I have learned things from you. I've learned things from Stanwood, from other people. Uh, I, I'm better at some things than other people. And if they ask for my help with those things, I'm happy to help. But I don't want to be um, a teacher in another sense, which, you know, I, I don't know how I define, but something like a traditional guru type relationship where someone is the, the sort of the buck stops there. They are the, the be all end all source of your spiritual life, sort of like a spiritual advisor in the, in the Catholic tradition where they, they have sort of authority over you and, and your spiritual life. And I think there actually is a really valid role for that, that, as I say, that helped me for years, but um, that's not what I want right now. And I don't for either for myself from someone else or for someone else. And um, part of that, I don't want to be a teacher because I see limitations in my own life and practice that I think would make it inappropriate for me to be that for someone else, uh, but also for my own in, 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 insofar as I want to learn, it comes back to what I said before of seeing a value and just trying my own path and learning for my own life. And that doesn't preclude learning various things from various people or being inspired by people or asking for help or guidance or advice, but I don't want uh, a one size fits all authoritative guru right now. And, and that's not to criticize that. In fact, as I say, that that has benefit, it, ha it had benefit for me, but that's not what I need right now. And it feels good to be doing something that's more fluid and uh, spontaneous and based in the various particularities of various relationships that I have right now. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. The, uh, I think you've spoken about this, um, on Twitter. Um, I, I hear a lot of what you just said is, is orienting more towards like, uh, one interpretation of like the spiritual friend model. Um, you know, cause I, recently I came across the idea that a spiritual friend can just kind of be another word for like that sort of hierarchical teaching thing. But I think there's also the more common interpretation. I'm not sure which is maybe correct or if there is any way to know what is correct. But the idea of like uh, peers, friends, this seems like something that is gaining steam to me. D is that your perception as well? That this is 
more it's more common that people are really trying to um, learn from each other and get away from maybe the way that things had been done. Um, and if so, um, what do you make of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really resonate with that description of being a spiritual friend. I, I think that that's a good way to describe what I'm looking for in people and how I'm trying to show up in connection with people, whether, you know, whether that's explicit or not. I mean, that just, that just means living my highest light and living the wisdom that I have. And that doesn't necessarily have to uh, talk about spirituality all or do anything that mm -hmm. seems spiritual with someone. It just means showing up and being there, being present, mm -hmm. demonstrating my practice. Um, but uh, yeah, I do think people are doing this more and more. I mean, in one sense, it's nothing new. It's just Sangha, basically what, what we're talking about of, uh, you know, community of spiritual friends. That's not new, but there are new trends there. And certainly I think the internet plays a big part in that. And, and the diversity of paths and practices and traditions that are out there, I think are make this sort of a, a good choice of, um, you know, um, my friend, Timothy Roy, wrote this article for Ribbon Farm a long time ago about uh, rolling your own culture and, and sort of the limitations of uh, how you can't, um, you know, you might look for like fitness advice here and ethical advice over here and how to eat over here. And you have to kind of piece together what works for you. And I think that's, that's true in the spiritual realm when there's so much on offer. And um, that's not for everybody. It, it can be really helpful to just be like, oh, I'm going in this tradition with this teacher, these practices, that's it not looking anywhere else. But for me at this time, like I'm doing so many different practices that fit together in ways that no one else could tell me how they fit together. And mm. uh, I have to do some of that discovery work for myself and with friends that are familiar with certain aspects of it. And, um, you know, that, that feels more authentic and alive to me right now than any one tradition that I've ever been exposed to. Uh, there, there's no, no tradition I've seen that, that can offer that to me. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. And off of that, sort of like the way that you're approaching things, I'm curious, um, just asking for your opinion, this is a huge question. So it's sort of a apologize beforehand. <laughs> um, and, and I just love, I love when, I love when people talk about this, even though it, there is no real, you know, no, no definitive answer, but what do you think maybe might be uh less accessible in this mode of peer um support peer teaching or 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 mentoring what may not be accessible that is accessible from that more rigid apparently rigid hierarchical guru student model that some people i think project on as like the way that things are or maybe are really drawn towards that for for wholesome or maybe unwholesome reasons? Yeah, that, it, it is a big question, but a couple of things do come to mind. Um, one would be, you know, awakening and what enlightenment is and what the completion of the spiritual path looks like. And, you know, as is a recurring theme on this podcast, there are so many definitions of what that is and what that could look like. And I, I'm still confused to this day about what that means. And, and when you're in a lineage with a teacher that, says something about that, you defer to them and you say, you know, this is what it is. And I will do the thing going towards what the teacher says. And, um, you know, there are people, I mean, there's reason for that. I mean, there, if you look at certain teachers, I think it's reasonable to say, yeah, this person is deeply realized. And if they say I am, or I'm not, that that's worth listening to in a way that, um, I mean, sometimes I'm a little bit alarmed by, or at least, uh, surprised by the, the culture on, contemporary websites or, you know, Twitter or, or whatnot of, uh, there's a lot of people that claim to be realized in different ways. And, um, mm. you know, I can hold that in different ways, but, but certainly, I mean, if you look at, um, certain teachers and certain traditions, I, I don't have as much reason to doubt that this person does have a realization that, that there, you know, that's the function of lineage is sort of, um, saying, yes, this is, this is, authoritative and true and good and there's there's tradition behind it uh, i think that's a value that you miss out in this sort of uh patchwork model of things um mm. another i think is ethics is ethics and character and how to live life um this is a little bit different for me i think the contemporary society doesn't um 
you know, as I was talking about before, there's no, no manual on how to live your life. And similarly, there's, I don't think that there is like an ethical framework that exists that encompasses the vast ethical problems that we face in current society. On the other hand, I think this is one of the values that a tradition provides of saying, these are the ethics that we practice, that we uphold, the ways that we do that. And that, that has value for people. Um, I think it's, I, I'm less concerned about that than the awakening one. I think there is significant value lost in, in sort of uh, losing lineage and tradition of, of what awakening is and is not. And I suspect that there's, uh, if not foul play, then some things that are misleading or, or things like that about people just claiming on their own, oh, I'm, I'm realized or whatever. Um, mm. I don't know, that's a speculation, but, but ethics, I'm less worried about it because there is no um, ethical code that, 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 ad to, that I found that adequately response to the complexities arising in contemporary society. They, they, they're, they're starting points, they're foundations. It's not that they're irrelevant. I mean, like still don't kill people, right? Don't, don't lie, don't steal, things like this. But um, there are a lot of complexities arising with, especially with uh, how large our civilization is and how the impacts are and how com complex they are, um, how wide scale they are, that, that local, you know, ethics is, is sort of, impoverished or inadequate to, 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 to accurately describe how you should act or live in a contemporary society. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm interested to hear from you. Um, I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone who's listening to this, but um, along with uh, the topics of, of contemplative practice and such that we've been talking about for a little bit here, um, productivity is I think that was like really my introduction to you, like getting to know you. You had a significant impact in, in a very small amount of time. You have this um, digital productivity coach, correct? Yeah. Um, which I made use of for, I didn't go through it by any means and it transformed my <laughs> relationship to technology. And uh, I, it was easy to apply that for me to my work, to my job. Um, and I'm only now really starting to apply that to my personal life, which is, you know, uh, very useful, very nice. So, so there's this productivity side of, of your interests. And then there's also the strategy. You used to talk a lot about strategy. I'm not sure if you're still writing as much about strategy, but I'm curious how, mm, how you feel productivity and strategy, which I see being related. How do, how, how does this complement contemplative practice and maybe in what ways are they at odds mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah it took me a while to tease out the answers to these questions of like why i was interested and how they were connected but i think the way that i see it now is um you know uh certainly at maple they would talk about awakening and responsibility or um you know in the tradition trish Christian traditions, they would talk about this as like faith and works, or, um, you know, there's, there's sort of the, the inner contemplative work that you can do that has to do with refining your own perception and your consciousness and your experience of self and world and other and all of that. And then there's also service and action in the world, taking responsibility, doing things to be of benefit and service. And um, I was always interested in both of those. And, you know, uh, I think that that's where productivity and strategy fit in is, okay, say you do want to act in the world, say you do want to be of benefit or be of service. That's, that's a good intention. I, I strongly recommend people have that intention to be of service with their life. Um, but how do you actually do that? And productivity and strategy are what fit into that of like, this is how you act effectively. And I'd say um, productivity is really about sort of acting effectively on the individual level. How do I keep track of my own tasks and responsibilities and projects and my own goals and desires and things like that. And that's what productivity is about. And then strategy is, is a natural expansion of that, of, especially once you, I, I've seen this again and again, once people really get a handle on their own acting as an individual actor with their own responsibilities, then you start to be like, okay, how can I coordinate with other people, um, both other individuals, but also other groups, organizations, things like that. And strategy is sort of asking the same questions, but at a broader scale of how do you coordinate with other actors, whether they're individuals or groups or organizations or whatever, how do you do that effectively? And that's how I framed strategy over the years. And, um, you know, that's been a very, again, uh, practical 
question for me. I've been interested in practical questions of how do I, in my current situation, coordinate with other people, specific people, specific organizations for specific goals. And um, I've had to look to things like business and military strategy to answer the kinds of questions that I had, but it wasn't because I was interested in their context of, you know, how do I make as much money as possible or how do I, you know, dominate and destroy another country? Uh, um, but, but the answers to the questions that I had, I found in that area. And, um, you know, I, I, in some ways there are conflicts, especially if you're trying to dive full into contemplative practice and, you know, entering deep concentration states and going towards enlightenment. I mean, that, that stuff is going to have limited utility if you're focusing exclusively on, you know, entering deep states and, and having deep realizations. But if you are in a path that involves service and being a benefit in the world and interacting in the world, then I think those things are quite relevant. And for me, that's, that's been part of my spiritual path is acting in the world and uh, trying to be of service and also cultivating my own virtue and character and ethics through those projects and responsibilities and all of that. And from that perspective, I think productivity and, and to some extent strategy are very relevant for people. Um, there, there are specific frames. I found specific tools for working with things. They're, they're by no means, um, you know, the tools that I found helpful for me in my situation might not be helpful to other people in their situation. They might not be, find the same answers that I found, but, uh, you know, they're, I've sort of helped to share the things that have helped me through the digital productivity mm -hmm. coach, through the blog posts that I've written. And uh, that's all very much a part of what I'm doing now. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, the strategy stuff, if I'm not writing about it, it's because uh, I sort of found the answers to the questions that I was looking for and mm -hmm. have internalized them pretty deeply and I'm acting based on that. And, you know, that might recur as an interest in the future, but I, it was almost like a long-term research project for me and that I sort of like found answers that satisfied me for the time being. Mm. Yeah, I'm curious, um, talking about like having found the answers um, to the questions you had. Um, is strategy, are you relating to strategy these days as something that you actively participate in or something that is passive, that is just sort of, um, just happening. It's just informing things you do, but you're not actively strategizing per se. Mm, neither of those seem quite right. If if I had to say more on the passive side, but um, maybe what I'd say is there were a lot of specific models and tools that I learned and learned to use and learned to apply. And those are very much in my thinking. And so uh, they inform the way that, you know, in a strategic sense, the way that I orient towards the world, that's Boyd's mm -hmm. OODA loop, which is one of the, you know, top five models that, that I learned um, uh, that, that really inform how I think. So that informed my orientation. And so that informs the way I perceive the world, the way that I think, the way that I act, uh, the decisions I make, what, how I prioritize my time, who I interact with. So it's, it's a part of the way that I act, but, but um, in a way there's a passivity there of like, I'm not, trying to learn more or, or, or grow more in that specific axis right now, I'd say uh, it's just internalized. And um, it's almost like, yeah, it's in a lot of ways, it's sort of a similar thing with my contemplative practice of like, there are certain consciousness shifts that have happened for me from my practice that are a part of how I perceive the world and go about my day and the way I relate to the world. And that's not an active priority for me right now, other than like say Tai Chi and you know, doing a lot of loving kindness practice and teaching that, mm -hmm. but like I'm focusing on being of service and being in the world. And so these are things that um, I'm using that are part of my experience, part of the way I live in the world. And um, it's almost like the metaphor that comes to mind. It's like, uh, as if I, I was like a, uh, someone that did a bunch of particular practice in a particular movement practice, like say strength training, but now I'm not necessarily actively doing strength training, but like my bones and muscles and, and whatnot mm. are still sort of like shaped by that. Uh, and I'm still able to use those skills that, that are available to me, even if I'm not actively like increasing that particular capacity. Mm. That's a great example. Cause, um, you know, in some situations where someone's like a power lifter and then they pivot over to like martial arts, you don't lose that tendon strength. You know, you develop that tendon strength doing that sort of thing. And you get to bring that pretty much, I think, through your whole life. Yes. Just because of the nature of, 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 of 
the way certain things develop. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, so you mentioned Meta, um, and uh, I know you are working on a book around Meta. And one thing, when I'm looking for books, oftentimes I spend a fair amount of time searching to find the right book on a topic, because I know it's going to flavor my approach to the, it's, it's going to inform how I'm informing myself on the topic. And so I'm curious. Uh, knowing that you're a rather diligent fellow, <laughs> I'm curious to hear uh, about the book generally and the process of, of what it's been like to write, but also um, how is uh, what you're hoping to offer up and, and also what you're offering as it is um, through the various means you are, how does it differ from what has previously been available on the, the subject of Metta, the practice of Metta? Yes, yes. Um, you know, I realized recently that there's a theme with my writing projects of, uh, you know, and, and other sort of service projects of creating the thing that I wish had been there when I became interested in the relevant thing. Um, that's sort of my goal is there's a gap in terms of the education and information that's available. It's, and often it's not so much that I'm, uh, creating new content as I'm synthesizing it in a way that's that's a you know more accessible to someone or you know puts what's already out there in a new light or something like that. So um you know most of my work isn't original in that perspective. It's it's a remix on other things and uh synthesizing it in a new way. And that is definitely true with loving kindness practice. Um, I think I'm trying to create the things that I wish were available to me when I started doing loving kindness practice in hopes that that benefits other people. And, um, you know, I, I, I stumbled a lot in learning loving kindness myself. There was like two or three months where it was not quite working and it was a little bit boring and hard and I didn't like it. And, uh, and then I kept going and, and kind of stumbled my way through it. And I think if someone had explained it to me the way that I teach it now, it would have clicked a lot sooner. Um, so it's not so much that I'm, you know, uh, it's not like I'm teaching a totally different technique than anyone else or teaching it, you know, some huge innovation in how I'm teaching it. I'm just trying to uh, teach it in a way that would have worked for me when I started out in hopes that that helps other people. It's not, it's not that I, with any of these projects, I'm actually able to go back and give that to myself and it's better, but it's like, hopefully people can learn from my experiences and mistakes and, and synthesis and, um, yeah, so with Meta in particular, broadly, I think of my work there as having sort of two prongs. One is a teaching prong and one is sort of a inspire prong. I wanna teach people to do Meta and I wanna inspire them to do loving kindness practice. And these are very different the way that I approach them. Uh, teaching I'd say is almost sort of like a point improvement from a software perspective of like, oh, I'm not, it's not, yeah, I'm not like teaching like, oh, this is meta 2.0. This is a totally new, radically different way of doing meta. It's like, no, it's not that. It's the same, same technique everyone else is doing, but hopefully I'm making some improvements to how I teach it, how it's taught uh, that help people to get it sooner, more deeply and, uh, you know, avoid certain pitfalls. I've learned a lot about the different pitfalls that people face when they're doing loving kindness practice, which actually was something I had to learn about because um, the specific challenges that I faced weren't, weren't the challenges that other people face. And in fact, there's actually a lot of variety in the various problems that people face. So I've benefited from doing the Saturday night meta sessions every week and hearing from people what's challenging from them so that I, you know, cause what's challenging for them is often something, you know, I may not have had in their particularity myself, but I can learn how to help people with that. And um, yeah, so I'm trying to incorporate that. And uh, I think the specific ways that I teach it at the very least would have been more relatable to me when I learned it than how it was taught to me when I learned it. So that hopefully that's an improvement. Um, but, but it's, as I say, just, it's sort of like an incremental improvement rather than a radical transformation on the other side with inspiring people to do love and kindness practice that I think could be a radical revolutionary change of, uh, yeah, actually having it being inspiring. I think, uh, the way that loving kindness practices is, is sort of, talked about or presented is not very inspiring. Uh, uh, at worst, it's sort of like, this is a, 
lame technique you shouldn't do that you know i mean there's i think there's sort of a sexism coded into it of like this is effeminate or weak or you know uh something like that and um i think i had to wrestle with that in my own mind like in, in some levels and um but even when people are you know more bullish on it and are recommending it it's still uh you know often it's considered like a secondary practice or uh, even if, the, if, even if people are trying to say, Hey, this is a great technique. You should do it. It's, it's still not very inspiring. Uh, and, and it's not, um, you know, the, the practices that are most widely taught in contemporary Western mindfulness are like, you know, following the breath, doing body scans, things like that. And then loving kindness is sort of an afterthought. And, um, for me, I think loving kindness would have been a better starting point than the things that I did start out. I wish I had started out with loving kindness and a few other things. And, uh, you know, there's other stuff out there. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on say IFS as well. I think IFS would have been great, but the, the challenge with IFS is that uh, I think you really need the support of someone that is experienced in it, either a coach or a therapist, or even just a seasoned practitioner to kind of help you learn how to do it in a way that I think my, you know, like recorded guided meditations, for example, could, could approximate in a way that people can do it on their own or uh, without needing a teacher or coach or something like that. Um, but uh, but I think there's there's room for tremendous improvements in in how people are inspired to do loving kindness practice. I, I I genuinely would like to inspire people to do loving kindness practice because it's been so beneficial and transformative for me, and I would hope that it would have those benefits for others as well. And uh, what I've seen in the current market of spiritual practice, as it were, is not very inspiring. It's not very cool uh, it's not fun, but, but meta actually can be fun. It can be enjoyable and beneficial. It feels really good to do the practice. Uh, you know, and, uh, I want to make it fun. I want to make it sexy, cool, interesting, uh, inspiring. And I think there's huge rooms for improvement there. Um, uh, the music video that I did with Michael Kersey was sort of an effort to do that. I'm still working on another video that will come out sometime, uh, I would like to do a dance club at some point, and there, there are things that I'll uh, do that are sort of, you know, more of it, you know, easier, lower scale than a, actually owning a dance club. But I would like to do that someday, like own a dance club that is focused on loving kindness practice. Mm -hmm. I'm envisioning something where like you can go and um, maybe you'd go at, you know, earlier in the evening and do a loving kindness sit together and learn what the practice is. And then it shifts and it's like, oh, this is a dance floor. And there's really good music that's playing that's for loving kindness practice. And, and you know that everyone else there is doing that practice. And that sort of uh, augments the, the, you know, the experience of it, because it, it is a very social form of meditation that, that goes well with other people doing it as well. And uh, it's, it's fun, like going to a dance club is fun in a way that you know, going to a guided meditation sit is not as fun or appealing or exciting. Like I, that's my fate. One of my favorite ways to practice right now is just dancing and doing metta and it, they go very well together. Your body doesn't hurt when you do it. It's fun. It feels good. Yeah. You know, on multiple levels, physically, emotionally. And uh, I think that's a more compelling offer than like, Hey, you can sit in a, silently in a room by yourself or with other people and like feel physically uncomfortable and feel agitated and wonder at the end why you did that and then do it again. Like that's not a very compelling offer. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm being hyperbolic here, but uh, you know, I think there are more, there's more compelling way to do that. And I, I would hope that I would inspire people to practice it uh, because it's, it's been again of such benefit to me in my own life. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that the depiction you gave of sitting in the room sounds pretty compelling to me. <laughs> well, you don't have to come to my dance club, my man. Uh, oh, no. Am, is this a, I'm being banned? No, Before it even no, exists. I would love to have you there, of course. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm curious. Um, yeah, um, I asked a bunch of questions all at once. So um, totally understandable that you couldn't be didn't answer all of them. So I want to hear about the book, but, but also I want to hear about like when you're writing this book, um, I imagine you're, 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 you're looking at a lot of different things that are already out there. And so I'm curious who has been influential to your understanding of uh, Meta, whether, whether through in-person instruction um, or through just reading their books um, or, 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 or their writings, um, listening to their talks. 
And then what's it been like writing this? Yes. Um, well, I mean, there's been a lot of influences on me in loving kindness practice. I mean, pretty early on, actually, I, 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 don't, I must have read it pretty early on, even if I didn't do the practice for a long time, but I read uh, Sharon Salzberg's book on loving kindness. And you know, that's, a, that's a good counterpoint, because I think her book is probably the most popular book on it. And it's like, I would write, like to write a book like that, that's like a, an introduction to loving kindness, but that is more like contemporary and resonant for people and, uh, you know, spoken from my voice to people that might read me instead of Sharon Salzberg, you know. Uh, so I'm not trying to do something fundamentally different than what she wrote, but, uh, you know, in, a, in my own style for my own audience, as it were, uh, at a different time, right? Um, and uh, yeah, but she was influential. Um, probably one of the biggest influences was Shenzhen. I mean, I did Shenzhen's practices for years and the way that I teach it is essentially inspired by his, you know, basic mindfulness, unified mindfulness approach to, you know, nurture positive or feel good uh, practices. Uh, that's the terms for it in basic mindfulness, unified mindfulness, respectively. He's sort of changed it over the years. He's always tweaking that, but, but that's inspired how I teach it. And uh, Rob Berbea as well. I think Rob Berbea influenced how I teach it, uh, the sort of tone that I take, the style of approach that I take. Uh, also, Cedric Reeves, who I had on the podcast, really influenced how I teach it as well as some of the practical points. And also just Cedric was doing a weekly uh, sit for the kinds of techniques that he was teaching with attachment style repair. And I decided, hey, I could do that for love and kindness. Why not have a sit every week that's for love and kindness? So that was an influence as well. Really appreciate uh, his example. And also he, he you know, supported me in some ways with that. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I've read a lot of different stuff over the years. Certainly people that I've known that I've practiced with, uh, Kaishan Harrison Heil that you know has been a huge influence on me. Just his example, uh, he inspired me to start practicing it regularly. I mean, I just saw that he was uh, a happy guy in a way that I wasn't. <laughs> you know, I was very unhappy at that time that I started, and I was like, "He's happy. I'm not. I'll do what he's doing. You know, I'll have what she's having." <laughs> uh, I mean, and, and you know, I I'm more like that now because I I practice this technique and. Mm. Um, I don't know. I think there's a way in which uh, that might be aversive to someone that's like in that state of mind where they're unhappy and they don't want to, you know, it feels threatening to change or like, you know, oh, am I changing who I am or something? But one, you're, you're not changing who you are or something. I'm still me. and I, did, I didn't become Harrison from that, but, but it feels good to be happy and you deserve to feel happy. If, if, and, uh, you know, it's your choice how to live your life. But if people do want to be happy, this, this is a, it's, a, it's a technique that amongst other things makes you happier. Uh, and that, that's, that's, that's worth knowing about knowing how to practice it and doing it if that's what you want. And I certainly would recommend it. It feels good to be happy. Uh, and it, it's a benefit to other people to be happy. It's a gift to the world to be happy. You know, that doesn't mean you should feel bad if you are unhappy or like you're a terrible person or something, but it feels good over here. <laughs> I recommend it, you know? Uh, so, um, yeah, he was a big influence on me. Just, just his example uh, seeing him, the way he lived his life and seeing that he was happy. And, you know, I have a picture of him in the book and, uh, you can see it in his face, I think in that picture, just, mm. uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm sort of tearing up a little bit, just thinking about him, but he's, he's such a sweet and lovely person. And, um, yeah. And then I, I'm right now I have a, a rough first draft of the book. It's very rough. It's sort of like my blog posts when, you know, hopefully the, the final product of my blog post is, is, polished. I feel very proud of the posts that I've written, but, you know, often in their first draft stage, they're pretty rough and uh, there's just pieces of things and it's uneven and so on. And then, but by putting it out the world in the world and getting feedback and asking for feedback in different ways, it sort of evolves. And so I'm at that stage where I've got a rough first draft, the, the sort of skeleton of the book is all filled in and uh, you know, you can read it now. People can go and read it. Um, it's pretty good. It's, it's oh, certainly better uh, than how any. can that happen? How could someone read it? Uh, it's a Google Doc that's open to the world, and you know I'll link to it in the tweets for this. But uh, it's just a Google Doc that's open, and people can read it. They can even make comments mm. or provide feedback or suggestions. Um, and I uh, that. that's great. That's great. I like that. I like that. You do so much stuff that's like transparent. You know, like even though the 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 way you do your well lack of copyright, right? Mm -hmm. Creative yeah. Commons, right? Yes. 
Yeah, that's really important to me. And I want it for, for many reasons, I want it to be widely available. I mean, I think loving kindness should be available to everyone. The Dharma should be available to everyone. Teachings that are benefit should be available to everyone. But also uh, just sort of strategically, you might say, uh, it helps to have people be able to give feedback sooner, right? Uh, mm. I like this. I don't like this. I want this. This is missing. Um, this doesn't make sense. You should look at this. Uh, I haven't read everything on loving kindness. I haven't taught it to everyone in the world. And the sooner I can kind of get that feedback, the higher quality the, the finished product will be. Although I suspect that this book will be like a digital book and that it will update and change and there'll be versions of it. So in some ways it's already done. And in some ways it'll change in, indefinitely. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that, that last bit about um, it being a digital book, being open for people just to read in an unfinished form. I mean, that's not, um, that's not the way most people do things. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't know the, the, the length of time you've sort of been engaged in online spaces um, until recently. You talked a little bit about, about this, um, you know, even podcasting, you know, you have a, a long history um, uh, yeah, with with podcasting, um, and so I'm I'm curious, like, social media is a tool, you know, and as is often said, tools are not neither good nor bad. It's all about how you use them. But social media seems like the kind of tool where, uh, you know, you might grip it by the blade. <laughs> a lot of people might be doing that sort of thing with it, and so uh, I'm curious how you approach social media. Um, yeah, generally speaking, how do you approach it to, uh, well, in the context of wanting to be a happy person, you know? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, uh, just sort of a sideways comment first that, that reminds me of, um, you know, you asked me about influences on the book and I think uh, Visa, Visa Convier Sami has been a big influence on me. Um, actually, you know, I had him on the podcast earlier and I asked him in that conversation about his books and why he wrote books and things like that. And when he answered that question, I mean, you can, you can watch it. I mean, like when he answered that question, I was like, oh, I should write a book on loving kindness. Okay. Uh, I get it. Like I had been doing actually his 200, 200 thing challenge with leading hundred guided loving kindness meditations. Um, and so he had already influenced me in that way, but it was like, that's the next natural next step is to write a book on it because I find myself saying a lot of the same things over and over and uh, they're kind of tricky to say and it'd be good to say them well and put them in a book so that uh, people can access that. So, um, and, and he actually talks about this of uh, the way he, he sort of compares it to like Hendrix and the guitar of like, he wants to be someone that teaches people of the power of social media and that like we're not really using it to its full extent right now and there's just much more possibility there and you know yeah there are problems with it but it's because it's sort of early days and people don't know how to use it well um so you know with respect to that question of how to be happy i mean i've just always been online i grew up online um i remember using like neopets early on and then later on made websites with GeoCities. And yeah, I, I ran a podcast like very shortly after uh, they came out and uh, also had a group of people that were, you know, young people making podcasts. I won't say, I don't want people to find this, but uh, people could probably dig it up if they wanted to. You're very young though. How old were you? Uh, when I made that probably 13 or 14, 15 oh. through that time period of my life. Um, yeah. And uh, it's funny because that, that podcast actually had like that I did at that time has like higher production value than this podcast. Uh, <laughs> like I, I, I barely edit this if I can avoid it. And uh, so it's not that you can't do it. <laughs> it's that I don't want to. Yes. Uh, uh, this one I'll actually edit because there's some noise in the background and I'll, I'll edit the, the audio for it, which I learned how to do at that time. But uh, yeah, my point is, yeah, I, I, I mean, I grew up when the internet was happening and that's always been a part of my life. And um, you know, I have a Tumblr for years. That was another thing that people can still find. And um, the projects that I'm doing now are very much uh, in connection to previous projects that I've done, either directly, indirectly, inspired by them, things that I learned, using skills that I learned from the earlier projects, things like that. And I suspect that will continue to be the case. Um, uh, and I'm learning from watching other people do it. I mean, what you're talking about with the book, uh, the way that I'm writing the book. I mean, that certainly learned that from Visa. He writes his books. They're like 
puts out drafts of them and people can see them and gets feedback early on. And that, that, that's a different way to write a book than, um, you know, something where you write it alone and then have an editor and whatever. And that, I don't want to write a book like that. Uh, similarly, I don't want to write a podcast and make a podcast. That's like, like the other podcasts that I see where it's like people put a lot of effort into editing them and adding production value and kind of appearing professional in a certain way. Like I, I don't have the energy for that. I don't have the time for that. <laughs> not, not only practically, like I just wouldn't want to do that, but like mm. it's, 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 it's spiritually exhausting for me to pretend that I am someone that I am not. Uh, and I don't want to do that. It, I, I, you know, I, 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 I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but my, my code name for this podcast is the just a tad awkward podcast. It's like, yeah. I don't, I don't care. I'm a little awkward. Like, I don't know. I have allergies. And so I've been like blowing my nose during this podcast, like whatever, man, uh, it's fine. You know, like that's who I am. I have allergies. Uh, maybe I have bad hair one day or my glass, you know, these glasses always like kind of tilt down a little bit, like whatever, like that's who I am. Like if people like me and what I have to say and what are the people conversations I have, like they're going to like it. And if they don't, whatever. Uh, there's plenty of good stuff out there. I don't, I'm having these conversations to enjoy them with my friends mm -hmm. that I enjoy. And, and, and I hope that it will be a benefit to others as well. It's not, I'm not doing it in isolation, but um, I, I want to put it out there in case it is a benefit to other people, but uh, I don't need it to be a benefit to other people or need it to be something specific to someone. I, I'm just having a conversation on a Zoom call and putting it out there. If people want to listen to it, great. If they don't, no problem. I, I suspect they will. The people seem to be enjoying them. But uh, yeah, I think maybe that's um, maybe a big level answer to your question is there is a lot of power to social media, but there's also a lot of optionality there. And it's important to use all of the sort of levers and options and locations to find something that feels good for you. And what feels good for me has evolved over time and is going to be different than what feels good for someone else over time. And um, I think it's important to to try things out for yourself and find what feels good for you and, and also respect other people for using it differently. I mean, um, people use these things very differently and uh, there's no right way to do it or no, as long as you're not hurting people, it's, it's not no wrong way to do it either. Um, you know, don't use these things to hurt people, but um, you know, uh, I've, I've been trying to find for years my own way of doing it that feels good for me. And that's inspired by other people doing their thing, but it's also very much my own thing and expression of my own individuality in life. And, and that's what feels good about it is, is that I'm doing it in my own way on my own terms. Uh, yeah. Is it fair to say that uh, Twitter is the place where you're most active on social media? Yeah, I think so. Um, Twitter, Twitter, almost feels like home right now in some mm -hmm. ways. Um, I mean, even the people that I'm staying with on this pilgrimage are mostly people that I know from Twitter, you know, friends that I know from, from other settings, but certainly a lot of Twitter folks. Um, so far on the pilgrimage, it's been 100% people that I've met on Twitter. And um, uh, yeah, it feels like my family or my home or my community right now. Um, you know, I take, right now I feel like I'm in sort of a, a little bit of like a dry spell or like I'm not tweeting as much right now. Uh, I, I'm sort of going through a process of uh, answering some questions for myself about the kinds of things I post and when I post them and where and why and how. And that's, that's, a, that's an internal process. I think something I'm always uh, wrestling with, especially from a right speech perspective. I, I, I want to help people and not hurt people with my speech. So, um, you know, uh, and be of benefit, but um, yeah. So I feel like I'm sort of in a quiet phase with Twitter right now. I'm not taking a break exactly, but I feel a little bit quiet. So uh, that's maybe where some of the hesitation comes from. But uh, just because right, right now at this exact moment that we're having this conversation, I've been spending a little bit less time on Twitter. But but it's very much a home to me, and that's where my friends are, and uh, where where the community is. And I, I love Twitter and what's happening there. And um, I suspect that's going to evolve. And that's been a theme on the podcast as well, talking to Murat and his uh, product spiel that he's making and talking to Gordon about different trends in the, in the internet. And I suspect there's a lot of things that will change. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, three, five years from now, maybe sooner, uh, I was on a different website that felt like it was meeting those needs in a better way. But, but right now, Twitter is definitely where, I, where I'm spending the most time. Mm. Mm.
Um, I, I suppose with, 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 this applies to the podcast as well as Twitter, but I'm curious how, how the process has been so far of doing this. Um, as someone who's listened to, to a bunch of them, I've noticed, uh, I've noticed changes um, in the way you, you sort of do things, but also if you started doing podcasts at like 13 or 14, <laughs> like this isn't new in the same way this is new to me. Um, so I'm curious, uh, how has it been so far? Maybe what's been unexpected and, and um, has anything changed, you know, the way you're approaching it? Um, is this something, this is another separate question, but like, is this mean you, you could just see yourself doing indefinitely or, you know, is it just like that kind of feel where it's like, all right, left turn, right turn. And I'm making my choice and, you know? Yes. Yeah. I mean, as far as the, the earlier podcast, I mean, that was something I did for like two years or so in my teenage years or something like that. And it wasn't, I wasn't making podcasts through that whole time. I, I stopped for a long time and, um, you know, actually something changed for me of why I was willing to do one again uh, was just this just sort of practically, but at a certain point podcast clients started allowing you to, um, you know, play podcasts at higher speeds. So I started listening to them again. And, and then mm. actually I found this um, one Chrome extension that lets you do that for video as well, uh, change to an arbitrary speed. Uh, YouTube lets you uh, change to up to two speed, but I can listen to things faster than that. And this video speed controller wow. lets you change that. And that was actually, it's weird, but that was like a blocker for me on doing a podcast because there's so much stuff out there. And I prefer to listen to stuff at advanced speeds that like, I didn't, it felt almost rude to put something out there if people couldn't do that. And it's a weird psychological block, but like knowing that that was out there made me sort of willing to do it again. Um, Interesting. You know, of course, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's somebody's choice how they spend their time. It's not my choice, and it's just an option for them. But that that made me willing to do it again. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, what's changed? I mean, there definitely has been a process of change that's happened. I think maybe that's a theme in general with this question about social media is just like letting it change over time and become different things, how you use it, how you interact with that. And that's, that's changed while I've done the podcast. I think it's still early days. I, I definitely could see myself doing this for a very long time. Um, I think conversations with people are, are sort of an intrinsic good and uh, they're intrinsically good for me. Hopefully for, I, I, I think often people tell me that they really enjoyed having these conversations with me. And uh, I think people who listen to them seem to enjoy them and benefit from them for various reasons, you know? Uh, but I think it's an intrinsic good. It, it just, good for me, good for the person I'm talking to, hopefully good for anyone listening to it. And uh, I, I'm always looking for things that are intrinsic goods. And this is, it's enjoyable for me. I enjoy doing them, um, especially because I put so little effort into editing them. It's not very much work for me. It's, it's actually uh, the stuff that I do to prepare is easy for me. I already have questions for people, I already have things I'm curious about. It's, it's mostly just enjoyable and doesn't take a lot of energy or time. Um, you know, scheduling them is, is really the bottleneck for them. Uh, having, especially with the pilgrimage, like having a place where I can record them and, and have the conversations is actually the bottleneck time. Um, but, but energy or interest or curiosity or even people is not the bottleneck. So that's nice. Um, there's always going to be a bottleneck. That's something I learned from strategy. So that's a good bottleneck to have is time and scheduling. Um, yeah. Uh, how has it changed though? I think one, I didn't really know what I was doing when I just started. I was just like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have some people on that I think are interesting and talk to them. And, um, over time I have more of a sense of how, how to do it, who I want to talk to, who I don't, how, um, that's one change. It's just sort of like, there, there's sort of a, a, a pattern to who I pick, how I talk to them, the conversations I have, you know, start, it sort of found this format of like starting with talking to people about their life and then asking them questions and then shifting into a more conversational thing. Um, I suspect that will change as well. It's already changing to some extent. Um, another one is, yeah, just leaning into it being more conversational. I think when it started, it was more of like an interview style. And, uh, you know, even with you, like I, I would, we've talked about this, but I would like to do more ones that are just conversations. And mm -hmm. 
that that comes less easily to me than the interview. I mean, it's easy for me to think of questions and listen to what people have to say to answer my questions. Um, I feel less comfortable just sort of vibing as we say on the podcast, but uh, I think that's a good growth edge for me personally and also uh, is worth doing. It's an intrinsic good. So uh, I think that's a shift that's happened is, is continuing to unfold. Hmm. Um, so on that note, do you want to, do you want to end this as an interview and just start a conversation? <laughs> yeah, great. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Cool. Cool. Um, I I've noticed this thing a couple of times, um, where, um, there's people who tweet regularly and who have had accounts for many, many years, like, a, like 10 years. And they're not like, um, you know, they're not putting out negativity that would repel people because there's some people doing that sort of thing, you know? But they're people who are like, you know, they're putting their name out there, they're putting the picture out there, and they've been on Twitter for a decade, and they've got like 12 followers, you know, and they get like no engagement with their tweets. And then there are people who just just skyrocket in terms of followers and engagement. And so I'm bringing this up because um, the same dynamic seems to occur with podcasts, where where there's people who are doing podcasts that if you can find them, they're very interesting. Um, they're, they're talking about topics that may be very niche, but for those who are into it, it's very valuable to hear someone going in, into this at depth. And so what strikes me about what you're doing with your podcast, as well as your Twitter, is that um, you have a built-in audience. And I once asked someone who does a podcast, I was like, do you think it's too late to do a podcast, uh, to start a podcast? And they were like, oh no, like definitely not. And they said, if you have a very small number of people, five or 10 people who like what you do, your life will change. Mm -hmm. This will change your life. Mm -hmm. And, and it made sense to me then. Um, and it, and it, I can see it more clearly now how that is true. Um, and so I'm curious, uh, about the people who you're kind of mingling with in this digital space, like, uh, all sorts of different people. There's, there's people who, uh, are themselves, you know, they're, 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 they're linking their real life, um, um, personality or, or identity rather. And then there are people who are a little more shadowy and there's a lot of people who are interested in esoteric things and, and magic explicitly. And so, uh, yeah, I'm just like, I, it, it seems like an exploration or at least an engagement that is that, that you're that you're having and uh yeah i don't know how to relate to it myself like ha there's so little context for individuals and so i just kind of have to be like well everyone is very different and i just have to trust that people are um you know that this is right for them that they're they're they have informed consent i suppose on what they're doing but it's just such a, a wild mix of people it's so interesting and uh, it doesn't seem, this doesn't seem to be the way Twitter works. More so, this is the way a small segment of Twitter is working. So, yeah, yeah, I just love to hear like, whew, like what, what's what's it been like um, going from going from like a place like Maple with a background in Buddhism to there's a lot of divination, a lot of magic stuff um, talked about, and just like yeah, how, how's how's all that? How's all that? <laughs> huh. Huh. It's part of that you're sort of like commenting on the people that follow me and who my who I connect to and who my audience, as it were, is, and and the, noticing that some of them are like interested in magic and and things like that. Where is that coming from? Yeah, you seem very open. You seem very open, and um, you have your stuff that you're interested in. And I think oftentimes people stay in their little categories. They stay yeah. in their little groups. And I see a lot of mixing. I see a lot of um, yeah. I just see a lot of mixing and friendliness across these boundaries that oftentimes people seem to be like, well, that's not my kind of person. And yeah. so um, you don't seem to be at all concerned that someone's going to mistake you, uh, mistake what you're doing for what you're associated with, uh -huh. you know? And I think that's a quality that we could do with more in the world. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a few things there that come up for me. One of them is like, really with any project that I do, but certainly the podcast, I want to start by creating something that is just like for me, like mm. it's not, it's not that it is intended to be just for me, but that I am my own taste. I am my own compass um, of for what's valuable, what's interesting, what's 
you know, alive. And if I'm not following that one, I won't enjoy it. And two, it's probably not going to be a benefit to anyone else. So I have to steer towards what's alive and interesting for me. And that that's like, I'm not going to compromise on that. So I'm not going to compromise on that with the podcast. I'm not going to compromise on that with my tweets. Um, I don't want to, um, there are certain recurring themes of what I tweet about, but it's because I'm, my interest in them is recurring. Uh, it's not because it's like, um, you know, uh, Oh, I mean, you know, there's a brief time where like all I tweeted about was Emacs, you know, which I still love. I think Emacs is great, but like, I don't want to become like the Emacs guy. I don't want to become mm. the Buddhist guy. I don't want to become mm. the productivity guy or whatever mm. it is I'm interested in that week. I'm interested in too many things for it mm. just to get pigeonholed into one. And, mm. and, and similarly with people, like I want to connect to people, right? Like I have a connection, a relationship with you, Chris, mm. like I have a relationship with many of the people on Twitter. That's, I want to connect with them. I don't, not because mm. they're like, you know, a magic person or a Buddhist person, or it's like, no, I have a relationship with this Chris person, you know, mm. uh, we're friends, you know, mm. uh, we have an intimate friendship and, uh, I value that more than an identity that either of us have. And, um, on the other hand, I think it's really interesting. It was very unexpected to me. Um, my own, yeah, my own interest in magic, as you talk about it with a K has developed this year. And it's something that I've encountered and, uh, you know, in relationship with that. And partially because of that, uh, you know, the causality there is interesting, but uh, I've befriended people who are interested in that. And so these different genres, neighborhoods of Twitter are sort of intersecting. And uh, I love to see that. I mean, I think before this year, I didn't know a lot of people that were say interested in both Buddhism and magic. And I myself wasn't interested in magic, but that's, that's something I'm interested in now. And so there are other people that are interested in it. And I think that that comes from one, following my own interests and two, yeah, following the relationships to the people. And it's not about um, isms or ideologies or boxes or labels. Um, that's, that's tiresome. Uh, if you, it's tiresome <laughs> to box yourself in, it's tiresome to box other people in. It's a, I think it's a violent to box other people in, in a certain way mm, uh, mm. to say, oh, you are just this person that is my identity of you. And it's like, no, nah, that that doesn't lead to good things on a lot mm. of dimensions. So I'd rather just connect to people and sh share what I'm interested in. And that's going to change over time and the relationships will change, but um, that's, that's more enjoyable than boxing myself in. And I mean, even if it's say loving kindness, stop being interesting or alive for me, like I'd have to, you know, walk away from that and say like, yeah, I wrote a book. It was good. I did some sits for a while. That's good. Mm. If something else is more alive or more benefit then then okay, I'll follow that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm really hearing what you're saying. So instead of boxing you in as a Buddhist guy, I'm going to box you in as the Emacs Buddhist guy. Right? <laughs> All right. Yeah. That's a good box. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have this, there's a funny, uh, one of my favorite shit posts that I've made is, uh, there's a meme, uh, of like, I finally got my Emacs set up the way I like it because you can really configure Emacs a ton for people that don't know. It's, it's a, it's a software program that lets you edit text, but you can do lots of things with it and you, you configure it the way you like it. And so there's like, I finally got my Emacs the way I want. It. And people typically put pictures of these like very involved, uh, computers or something, but I have a picture of me sitting in full Lotus and, uh, just meditating there. And, uh, yeah, that's, I finally got it the way I like it. Emacs Buddhist over here. Uh, yeah. Have you have you heard of uh this book? It just came, I think it just came out recently this year, if not this year, last year, called Buddhist Magic, published by uh, Shambhala. Have you heard of this? No, no. I think well, maybe you mentioned it to me a while ago, but I haven't read it. Uh, mm. Yeah. Very interesting. I'm reading it now, and um, I haven't finished it, but my understanding, the way it's being framed, is that it's focusing primarily on one um, one text. From, from one tradition, I believe from the Tibetan tradition, but he's going through the history of magic um, and he's talking about all, he just feels like he's breaking down the, the, the common stereotypes of monasticism and he's breaking down like, I mean, there's this one part that's really nice talking about like how monastics interacted with the villages that they're living in and, and, and like this house they found where the, some of these scrolls were, were unearthed um these magical scrolls there were four monks living together in just a house mm. and um of course like what's their function in the village it's like well they're they're doing all sorts of magical stuff and like protective prayers and such and and uh i mean that's just so different from what most people think of in terms of like what is a monk living like you know like 
a house of four people who are practicing and who are part of like a community mm, seems a lot more relatable <laughs> than than the image of uh, a temple on the hill where there's all these people dressing a certain way and, and not really relating to people except to go around and get their food and such but yeah highly recommend it like mm. I'm, I'm really happy to read it because um mm, i don't know do you get the sense that like um there's almost like a daniel ingram being sort of the exception to this i think he for a lot of people at least maybe in our age group he kind of brought that forced to people to look at that but do you get the sense that people are like uncomfortable with this generally speaking like they want to keep these things separate because buddhism is respectable and magic is you know um not respectable i mean i, I think i would characterize myself that way if i thought uh mm. i mean i don't know it wasn't explicit but something like that uh before where you know had some kind of aversion to magic and thought it was unrelated to Buddhism or spiritual practice or fraudulent or something. But um, yeah, I mean, meeting different people and talking to them about it shifted that for me. And, uh, and, and also just seeing in my own experience that like various things that I were, was doing or was experiencing were described by that, like that, that term fit better than uh mm whatever else I thought I was doing. And uh, I would actually, you know, this is just in case someone else is in that shoes. I, I wish I could go back and say this to myself, but like, I think it was a little threatening or scary to be like, oh, well, this is what I'm doing and I don't know what's going on and is this okay and stuff. And um, I actually found sort of a Buddhist frame that resonates for me of what is happening there of like with the Noble Eightfold Path of, uh, you know, it starts with right view, which we talked about earlier, but part of, yeah, part of right view is that actions have consequences, that what you do matters. And mm. after that, there's right thought, right speech, and right action. And I think uh, in the Buddhist perspective, the thoughts that you have are themselves actions. In wrong view, in the widespread wrong view of the world, like your thoughts don't matter, your actions mm. don't have consequences, and thoughts are not actions that, and they don't have consequences. I think that's a view that's very widespread, that what you think does not matter. But that's not true in a Buddhist frame. And mm -hmm. in fact, your thoughts are actions that do have consequences and therefore do matter. Um, and so magic takes that perspective of like, hey, your thoughts matter. Uh, your thoughts matter. And then what kinds of thoughts do you want to think? And it's perfectly possible to uh, hold that in a way that's ethical and beneficial and good, uh, that's a benefit to other people. I think, you know, I've come to see the Bodhisattva vows as uh, this is just a way of seeing in, in Rob Berbea's parlance, but like, uh, you know, a way of seeing that as like the Bodhisattva vows are this magic cosmic spell that have been cast by many people over many centuries that's a, trying to be of benefit to all beings in all places. And that, I mean, that's something I've, you know, already done, but I'm happy to sign up for and uh, being a benefit to all beings in all places. And uh, yeah, that that's, that's an inspiring way of framing it for me. Hmm. Do you think... Um... So the, the, I'll just say where this is coming from, but there's a, the newest episode of Deconstructing Yourself is with uh, Chandra Easton, and it's about vision and visualization. Um, and one of the things they talk about is like uh, in Theravada or in more like kind of mindfulness um, uh, approaches, visualization is um, not employed seemingly, and people kind of think that that's just the way it is. It's like, no, 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 we follow our breath or we do this, we do that. But of course, there are the visualizations on... Um, you know, bodies in various states of decomposition, um, which probably is not applicable to most people who are listening to this, <laughs> to, to want to work with that. Um, but they talk about meta and they talk about visualization and meta. And just to look at it from like a, from an outsider's perspective, I don't see how this is very different from a lot of things that people would call magic otherwise. Do you, do you feel like that's the case? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, they're all just words, you know, and, and, and mm -hmm. the, the territory mm -hmm. is very similar and um, you know, love and kindness done well employs visualization and images. And uh, mm -hmm. that has those, those thoughts have consequences on your perceptions and behavior and uh, 
that, I mean, you can call that magic if that resonates for you. You don't have to call it magic if that turns mm. you off, but like mm. it does have effects. You know, if you do love and kindness practice, it has effects. I mean, even, even contemporary science says that there, there are studies that show, you know, love and kindness has effects. And um, I really like it. You mentioned Daniel Ingram earlier, but uh, Hanjo pointed out to me, uh, Hanjo Yutaku from Twitter pointed out that uh, the, the second version of Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha has a chapter on magic and the Brahma Viharas. And, uh, you know, Daniel Ingram's sort of uh, controversial, but I, I really like this chapter a lot that Hanjo recommended. And I think it has a good account of uh, what magic is and how it relates to Buddhist practice and in mm. particular, the Brahma Viharas, including, including Metta. So yeah, I would, following Hanjo's recommendation, would definitely recommend that to folks if, they, mm. if they're interested in this sort of thing. Mm. Can you say um, uh, to whatever extent you want to talk about it, but where, where is your own interest or background in these things coming from? Um, generally speaking, I think that um, uh, Buddhism is a very well-constructed, elegant system for um, certain purposes, for certain aims, and that, that as it existed, as these traditions formed in the East, they don't really fit well with a Western, modern Western lifestyle. And I think that um, the Western traditions, um, which could, you know, very loosely and sloppily, because that's how I like to do it, uh, <laughs> could very loosely and sloppily be, be termed uh, under the magic or magic adjacent umbrella. I think that that offers a, a counterbalance to the renunciative elements that people may be receiving from approaching Buddhism uh, that maybe they aren't aware of the bundling, because of course there are there are practices approaches for lay practitioners, and also there are techniques that are totally appropriate for people living in the world, whether as um, like intense hardcore practitioners living in the world, or just as you know, this is I'm just doing this because it works for me, and it's not my whole my whole my whole thing. Um, and so I think that. Um, that side of things in Buddhism seems a bit more difficult to access, a bit more difficult to understand, whereas the symbolism, um, the general mechanics of what we would call magic, this has just been poured into us since we were children, I think. And so it's so relatable. Um, maybe the biggest thing to get over is the idea that like, this is all linked up to some dude with fucking horns who's like, <laughs> gonna like drag you down to hell yeah <laughs> um uh, but but i think that's probably a really worthwhile thing to get over for most people who have that um so yeah i just think they're, they complement each other quite well and i think there's also something really nice about um the word magic is absolutely ridiculous mm -hmm. and i think that's a feature not a bug i mean you just sound a certain way when you use the word there's there's a Mm, a significant portion of people may stop taking you seriously. And I think that the prerequisite of not needing to be taken seriously <laughs> is useful, mm. is valuable, and is a nice counterbalance to the uh, seriousness, which some people can, um, uh, seriousness isn't what I'm pointing at. It's, it's the affect of seriousness, I think, that I'm pointing to. Mm. And so once you sort of give up your respectability by talking about magic, you don't have to you don't have to worry so much about people thinking that you are some all-knowing totally proper right respectable person you can just be another goofball or not be a goofball but still you're you're at least endangering your respectability um yeah that's how i that's how i relate to these things um and Would it's you... just a huge curiosity too you know it's like it's it's fun stuff the culture there's a reason why Harry Potter was as popular as it was, right? It's just, it's fun. Yeah. If you had to, I mean, I'm hearing that you like having like a term that has that sort of color to it, but if you had to pick a more serious tone, like it, it seems to me like causality might be like a very dry word that you could use for the same stuff. Would, would you would agree with that? Like, I wouldn't prefer yeah. that term, but it seems like a uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's that like, um, there's that common phrase that everyone is doing magic all of the time. Mm. It's just that some people aren't aware of it, something like that. And yeah. of course, if you're not aware of it, you're probably doing bad magic because you don't uh -huh. know, you don't believe, as you said, right view, 
you don't actually understand that everything you do has a consequence, not consequences in terms of punishment, but consequence in terms of like effect. Yeah. This will naturally lead to other things. And I mean, just cause and effect, like yeah. whew, just, you can just, to some degree, I think you can just stop right there. It's like, yeah. if you can understand cause and effect, which is like, as far as I can tell, uh, <laughs> at least a life's work, you know? Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Causality, I think is a decent, a decent, um, more respectable word. Yeah. I think a lot of academics, like um, I think education, like the conversation mm. about education and, and the, the, the mechanics of learning, it brushes up against this stuff in a pretty consistent way. Um, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Huh. Anything else that you wanna chat about while we're still talking about? Yeah, I have, I have one last thing I'd like to talk about, which is mm. that since we made this minor shift from like, oh, interview mode to conversation mode, what I notice is for myself, um, it's difficult to make that shift because me and you have a way of talking privately or, or uh, in, a, in a shared context where the other people, we know them. And so um, it doesn't feel right to just have a conversation the way me and you would. And so mm-hmm. I'm just curious to, to kind of close this out. Um, like, how do you think, how do you think people, you, me, anyone listening to this, how can we sort of um, maybe simultaneously um, build context and share context in a natural way? Like, cause the interview format's useful, but I mean, boy, there's, it's, it's a different mode and it's a little stiff, it's a little rigid. And so, um, yeah, do you have any ideas? Like, like, how's that evolving for you or, I don't know. I mean, it just feels like something that that we're figuring out as a culture just through podcasts. I don't Mm. know. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, What do you mean by that? That is something that we're figuring out as a culture through podcasts. Like, um, so I referred earlier to the man with the horns, um, Joe Rogan. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But I think Joe Rogan's podcast, the popularity of his podcast, like, a lot of young men, I think, who didn't really have role models who were maybe both signaling traditional masculinity as well as kind of being a, a nicer version of that. And also like having values, right? Like over and over and over again, have through his conversations with people, because he's pretty good at this. He's, he's really good, I think, at conversations and he's interviewing for sure, but the line is super blurred. And People can talk down on them all they want. And, and you know, there's, there's criticism some people have that I think are valid, but what he's doing there, I think is like, it's immensely popular. And I think it's popular because we're hungry for conversations, but it's like, how do me and you have a conversation without making people feel left out? I don't know. Mm. I don't have the answer mm. to that question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, he's been an interesting example for me, uh, if only with his, his sort of like, on paper, but, you know, I've recently started listening to his stuff. Uh, I hadn't listened to his stuff until very recently, and I've only listened to kind of five episodes or something of his stuff. But, um, you know, just the fact that he's done so many conversations for so long and, uh, you know, the, the way that he does it and knowing about his format, that's been, an, you know, an influence for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think I think it is possible to have a blur, blur blurred lines between the interview and conversation and that's something that I'm learning how to do with these conversations but uh I I like the interviews that I do and that I have with people because um how to put it I want to I I mean I, I try to start with the most basic questions and build up and sort of like compose shared context for me and the person I'm speaking with and the listener and Mm. that that that's careful preparatory work but it builds up those conversations that are really juicy and um mm. i think that they're related and yeah i think i it, it could be like a growth edge for me to learn how to move in and out of them and blur and so on but uh i like you know starting with really simple questions and asking and hearing what the person has to say and even if they're saying something that i already know i've heard them talk about before it's like they say things that are interesting to me and then it does add to shared context for the listener and 
um, I think in that way, it's, it's sort of a gift to the listener to build up that shared context so that they can understand, even if I already knew something about the person, like mm. making that shared context and making it explicit. And then to the extent that there are like juicy, alive, vital conversations that happen after that, I see them as, as springing up from that soil. And, mm. uh, you know, you need that, that um, shared context that's built through an interview style, style questions to have those kinds of conversations and mm. um, go to places that you might not otherwise. So um, as exciting and as alive as those conversations are, I think that they're, they're sort of related to the, you know, the first half of a conversation. And mm -hmm. I expect people that have listened to the podcast a lot at this point will see a trend of like, yeah, the first hour maybe is sort of dry and yeah. more stiff and whatnot. But um, I think if people stick it out for the last, you know, half or quarter or whatever, like it tends to get pretty juicy. And yeah. I think, I think that that's, uh, I mean, maybe it'd be nice if it was, you know, hundred percent juicy and alive or something, but I'm enjoying myself and I think mm -hmm. they're good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and that yeah, that comes yeah. from the, the earlier part. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I don't have any more questions uh -huh. and if we were on the phone right now, I'd be like, yeah, if, you know, I got the day off. <laughs> uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, this is fun. I hope, I hope that, um, yeah, I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed it. You know, in terms of trusting me to to interview you instead of having you interview yourself. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else you want to? Anything else want to say? Yeah. Well, thanks for doing the interview. It's been fun, and I, I enjoyed the conversation as well. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll just make explicit for the listener something that's been on my mind for a while. But uh, you know part of the reason I wanted to do this conversation and also interview Chris previously was to build up that shared context for something bigger. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what it looks like, but I'd like to try having a few conversations with Chris that are more just conversations. And I think it'll be really interesting if, um, you know, we've, I've interviewed Chris and Chris has interviewed me and they're, they're sort of like uh, a larger pool of shared context there where what kinds of conversations are possible if all of that is on record and someone's listened to them before. And I think um, the conversations that I have privately with Chris, as he's sort of alluding to, are quite good and alive and vital. And so I think we'll have some good conversations in the future. So I'm looking forward to trying that with Chris. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tasha. Yeah. Thanks, Chris.